Revenue neutral rate hearing. Dr. Burke? Yeah, we're going to turn this over to our Director of Finance and Business and Doug Schwinn. Good evening. Um, this will be very short. Um, this is a new requirement this year that we hold a hearing. And I have just one slide to share with you all this evening. And it was just a timeline of what was required of us. Um, first, we had to wait on Johnson County to email us our R and R rate for this year. Um, it ended up it did end up getting revised because there was a miscalculation on the first one. Uh, and then the board took action. You you all did and adopted resolution twenty two oh seven, which gave notice to the county that we were going to exceed the R and R. Um, the very next day, I mailed the form, the required form to Johnson County with our proposed tax rate, letting them know it would not exceed 69.875 mills, which if that would have happened, it would have been plus two mills for this year. Um, thankfully, as we put the budget together, um, it was not necessary for us to raise it two mills. And in fact, we're dry, dropping it just uh, a little over a tenth of mill. So um, you did adopt a notice of hearing um, that was published in the paper with a proposed tax rate of 67.719 mills. Um, it was published in the paper on September 1st, uh, which met the 10 day requirement. And so here we are waiting for any comments from the public and I'll turn it over to them. Does the board have any questions for Doug? Ben? The only question I had, can you remind me, when was the last time we raised the mill? Um, it, there is a slide on the next okay, presentation next, I'm sorry. I'm th that will show. I, I think uh, we're in the second year of dropping it. So it had been two full years ago that we did have to raise it because of the last bond issue we passed. 1819? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, it, it went up a little over four mils. Yep. And then the last two years, we've been able to drop it just a little bit. So okay, thank you. To help me understand the math on this yeah. revenue, revenue neutral rate for capital alley. I'll just do that one because we always levy eight. How do you come up with the 5.207? Uh, is that, how does that? <laughs> it's not it is a weird calculation because, um, it, and in fact, I didn't agree with the math when I first saw it. Um, because it seemed like a, a lot lower number than I would have anticipated. But um, when I asked the county their calculation, they gave me a long explanation where um, the properties that are tax ex are, um, that filed for um, exemptions, exemptions, yes, were taken out of the equation. So there was two different equations that went into the number. And part of the capital outlay is reflected in the 5.209 number that you just referenced, but part of it is in the other rate. So it's it's a very convoluted mess. I I can show you the calculation, but um, that's okay. But yeah. what does the five represent? Just it's the number that it spits out. Yes, the, the county calculated and they they gave it back to me based on. Um, the assessed valuation of the properties they felt should be included in that calculation. So okay. oh, that's what I was saying. It's <coughs> the fact that while we didn't raise the mill levy for, for capital outlay, the assessed valuation went up by 5% essentially. And so that's the change for the properties that were included. That's, that was the change. Well, assessed value went up about 10%, which probably a 10% increase on assessed valuation should drop the mill levy if you were staying revenue neutral from, I would have anticipated eight to maybe 7.2, 7.3. Uh, so I was shocked when it was 5.2, that was way lower, but it was because they pulled out those um, exempt properties in that calculation. There are some properties that are taxed differently. So what they did was calculate, so there's part of all that, the 20. Brad, Mike. So obvious on the general fund, they exempt $20,000 of properties. So everything that they do slightly differently, they put in a different basically column. And so it looks like capital outlay is five point something, but really there's some properties that would go into our 8.0 that they're not counting because they're calculated differently. 
They only calculated things on the revenue neutral rate because of their calculation. You can't, they couldn't mix things. And so they calculated part of our capital outlay separate because it was calculated differently. And then only cal only threw in the bucket the stuff that was calculated the way capital outlay should be. It's I don't really understand why. Yeah. But some of it's just not. Yeah, I, I don't think any school district in the state is going to be able to be held harmless on the revenue neutral rate. Yeah, I'm not aware of anybody that was able quite to avoid a, it. I've been in enough superintendent meetings and I've not had anybody say that they were going to be able to do that. So, <laughs> and this isn't just school districts, it's uh, everybody. counties and cities and, everybody. and libraries and a lot of other groups. So, any other questions for Doug? Usually at this point, if there's anybody in the community that has questions or concerns, they bring it up now. All right. Thanks, Doug. We'll bring you back in about nine minutes.
turn this over to uh, Doug Swin, and he's our Director of Finance, and he'll present the budget hearing. Okay, good evening once again. Uh, now we're going to dive a little bit into the budget numbers, show you what happened this year. Um, first thing I'm going to show you is uh, our FTE uh, anticipated for 21, 22, and then actuals for the last five years. Um, you'll see we had a very modest growth of right around 70 um, a year ago. Um, but this year we're expecting somewhere in the close to 300 range. Um, and of course, we've talked about at previous meetings, that's because a lot of families chose at the beginning of last year to um, enroll either virtually or in private school or homeschool or whatever ever other options. Um, and now many of those kids are back with us again and including the growth that we've seen in our community. So 300 is a big, big number. We haven't seen that in forever. Oops, wrong way. Um, thought it'd be interesting to show you what's going on around Johnson County as far as uh, growth in FTE. That's the easiest number to pull. I try to get head count, actual bodies, but FTE is easier to pull. Um, you'll see that uh, Blue Valley has been pretty much flat. And then last year with uh, um, COVID and a lot of kids, again, choosing other options, they had a 2.7 decrease. Um, despite everything, we I think we were one of the few districts in the state that actually grew last year. We still grew 2.2%. Um, and you'll see the other four Johnson County districts uh, decline anywhere from 3.1 all the way up to 5.4%. So everybody in Johnson County saw pretty significant decreases last year, except for us. Assist valuation. It's just utterly amazing how much this number has grown uh, and it's really shot off uh, the charts here the last four or five years. Um, even back in the, the recession, back in, what was it, 08, 09? Um, even into 10, 11, and then from then on, it's been straight up. So, and 30, 30 million in assessed valuation growth this year is just uh, an incredibly good number and calculates out to about 10%. Here's a look at state aid. Um, and you'll see that we took a nice increase this year in our bond and interest state aid rate. Uh, last year, we had 45 on uh, bonds prior to 7-1, 2017. Um, and this year going to 59%. But that's based on a combined enrollment, not only uh, brick and mortar, but virtual. So that middle column, when you see the enrollment numbers, um, that 6190 uh, included virtual growth. And so that makes our um, assessed valuation, I'm sorry, the, the 5731 is the, really the important number because it made our assessed valuation per pupil drop by almost 10,000 per pupil. And anytime you, your assessed valuation per pupil goes down, the next year your state aid goes up. It, it lags a year. So you kind of see that diagonal increase. Well, the bad news is if you go down to 21, 22, you'll see that our projected assessed valuation per pupil is going up by, what, about $1,300 per pupil? Well, if assessed valuation per pupil is going up, count on state aid next year to go down. So um, we got a nice benefit with this year's budget, but we're going to go the other direction next year. Mill levy history. Um, here you'll see that it was um, – three budgets ago that we did have to um, finally increase the mill levy after a 12, I believe it was a 12 year decline. Um, you have to go clear back to 2007. Uh, we were at just under 70 mills and, and we had a nice streak going, but uh, in that streak, we passed two no increase bond issues, which is very impressive. They were some of the largest bond issues in, in our district's history. But the one in 2018, we had no choice but to finally increase the mill levy. However, the last two years, we have seen slight decreases in it. Um, I'll warn you, though, that, that there's no guarantee it's going to continue to go down. Um, it, um, we're going to have a lot of pressure next, on next year's budget. And it's very possible we may be looking at a mill levy increase next year. So... 
here's just a breakdown um, by the different categories. Uh, you'll see two things to note. It's been a long time since we levied in special assessment and in special liability expense fund. We've been relying on the cash balances in those two. Um, this was a year that um, it was time to begin levying in there because our cash balances were getting kind of dangerously low. So we're going to build those funds back up. But the good news is even by levying in those two categories, we got some savings in our supplemental general uh, levy. Um, and that was able to help offset the increase in those other two funds. Altogether, you'll see it's just a little over uh, 1.5 1. 1. mils. Uh, I'm sorry, 0.15 mils. Yeah, down 0. 0.15 mils. Here's a, a snapshot of what's been going on in Johnson County the last 10 years. I thought it was kind of interesting. If you look back in 2012, 2013, we were the second lowest uh, by quite a margin. Uh, at that time, Gardner and DeSoto had mill levies in the 80s, um, and they were going through some rapid growth at that time. Whoa, I did not touch anything. That was weird. That was a phantom click. Sorry about that. Don't know what happened there. Um, so back in uh, 12, 13, you'll see that Gardner and Minnesota, they had the two highest uh, mill levies in the state at that time. They were going through some rapid growth. And, and since then, they've been able to drop their mill levies quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, we're no longer the second lowest. Uh, but we're still in the, you know, we're still in the mix. We're, we're second from highest, uh, just under Olathe, but you'll see two other districts are in the 60s. Um, Shawnee Mission, they, they've been down in the 50s forever. They just got an incredible assessed valuation and, and are able to keep their, their mill levy fairly low. So um, overall, not too bad uh, when you think about all the growth we've dealt with uh, in the last 10 years. Um, this is a slide I just threw in. Again, it was mentioned at the budget workshop, um, fighting for fairness, uh, some of the challenges we face based on current statutes and the, the funding of school finance, uh, the de delayed enrollment cost us a huge amount. Um, had we uh, been funded based on this year's kids and took advantage of levying uh, the greater amount in LOB, that would have caused a, a 0 0.5 mil increase um, to capture that 379,500. Um, if we would have got the benefit of having all of our um, outstanding debt at the 59%, you'll see we could have dropped bond an interest 7.1 mils this year. And last, uh, we... We're missing out on new facility waiting, which was part of the formula for many, many years. Um, had we been able to, to capture that amount, it would have caused a, a mill levy increase of 0.1 mils, very nominal amount. So even if you add that all together, uh, we'd be dropping six and a half mils had we um, had all these been in play. I think it's important to discuss our promises that we've kept over the years uh, when we went out for bond elections. Um, since I've been with the district um, in 2003, we are 4 0 on bond issues. We have not failed one. Uh, it began with uh, 2003, the 48.6 million. We did tell voters, and it's amazing it passed back then, that the mill levy was going to increase by 14.5 mils. It just that's a astronomically big number when you think of mill levies. Um, and we failed two bond issues prior to that. Uh, it, at that time, that was the biggest bond issue our, our district had ever um, successfully passed. It did go up 14 and a half, but you can see that even with that layered in today, it is lower than what we were back in 03. And there's three other bond issues that have come into play since then. So. Uh, 2003 was the 30, 39.0 uh, million. Uh, we, we told voters we're not going to increase the mill levy, and we didn't. 2016, 82.4, we promised we would not increase it for two years. We said we, we can't guarantee beyond that, um, but I'm happy to report that uh, we, we've held true to that promise. How the last one, the 2018, the 72.0 million, we said it would increase by 4.25. Um, actually, early on, we thought it was going to be more like seven, 
And when we finally got the, the numbers put together, it, it actually dropped to four and a quarter mils. And the last two years, we've been able to drop it just a little bit. So very proud of our track record. Um, when we go out and, and ask the voters for assistance building the buildings that we have today, um, they the last four bond issues were all very successful um, and people have gotten behind us. And, and I think if you, I know you've toured our buildings and uh, it's very impressive what, uh, um, what everybody's done. And I think it's, it's buildings that we can be very proud of and, and are lasting a long time. I mean, if you go in the high school, it, it, it looks almost brand new. It's, it's really impressive how staff and students have taken very good care of that building as well as others within the district. Do you know how many, uh, or how many mills or the rate that we've saved based on the fact that we've refinanced our bonds Oh, to, to, I mean, uh, what is it almost, I know it's over 2 million, but is it more than that? Well, that slides next. Um, right. and I talk Didn't about, you? yeah, since 2007 restructuring debt saved uh, 10 million in interest payments. So, um, when you figure one mill levy today is generating, um, 330,000, uh, you're, you're talking several, so obviously we wouldn't be paying that 10 million in one fiscal right. year that spread out over a longer period of time. But I would, I would venture to say you're looking at two, three mils a year, you know, that we're able to save. So um, it's, it's very impressive. And uh, we, we've been very fortunate to, to take advantage of that. Otherwise the mill levy would be going up much more today. So and I believe that is my last slide. And with that, uh, if there's anybody from the, the public that has questions, this is the public's opportunity to uh, ask questions about the budget and the numbers if they have any questions. And if the board has any, I'm willing to entertain those as well. No, <laughs> but you do have, I did leave you all a copy of the budget book, um, the budget support document, 200 pages of, of reading pleasure. Uh, if you ever have trouble sleeping, pull it out, go through a couple pages and you'll doze off and nothing flat. Uh, but I, I try to put a lot of historical record in there. Um, so that one, I don't forget what I did a few years ago and um, kind of where we're going and where, we're, where we've been. So uh, feel free, if you, if you get home, you start reading through it, you have questions, uh, sh give me a call, shoot me an email. Uh, I do post the whole entire budget support document electronically on our website. Um, people can go there and look at it. And I would encourage the public, if you're listening online, and have questions about our budget, don't be afraid to reach out to me and I'll be happy to try to get your questions answered. So. Uh, Doug, what uh, page would I find food service? Food service, uh, that is fund 24 and they are in numerical order. The virtual capital outlay, driver training. Food service is on page 145, 145. There's going to be some weird numbers, especially in the revenue column uh, for last year because of um, kids on free meals and, and also this year with the federal government uh, approving free meals for everybody. Uh, we got a lot, a lot of money that came in on the revenue side from federal sources. Um, there is still some that trickles in, trickles in locally because sometimes kids get hungry and they want extras or, or a la carte and second meals. And so there is a little bit of money flowing through there, but most of it uh, was federal aid. I'm excited to see the uh, balance in the gifts and grants column. I think a few years back, that was pretty small. For quite a few years, it was really small. Yes, it, it has grown. Um, 
And I know we got a very significant grant this past year through the Kauffman Foundation. Um, Mr. Wilson can talk a little more about that because I believe he was heavily involved in applying for that grant, the 75,000 that we got from them. Um, and I think that can lead into other potential grant funds down the road. So that's kind of an exciting project on the horizon. But we haven't spent all that 75,000. So that's why that balance is a little bigger than, than it has been in prior years. I know capital outlay, it, um, it did have a pretty healthy balance in there, but uh, we, we did spin that down building this facility we're in tonight. Um, but uh, the good news is uh, this year, levying eight mills, we're gonna get that built right back up and uh, we'll be in really good shape for the future. So I, I can't think of any major construction projects that we would have on the horizon that would eat up our, our cash balances and capital outlay. Um, and so we can begin using those funds really as they're intended for, um, as far as buying computers and maintenance and a lot of that stuff we've had to lump into bond issues in the past, because for many years we didn't have a capital outlay and that was the only way we could buy, um, our, our computers and, and some of the maintenance that we had done. But, um, the eight mills is going to help us out a lot going forward. I just wanted to point out again, I'm on the, from your promises kept slide. Can you go back to that? The which one? The promises kept slide. Yeah. I don't know what slide number that is. Yeah. Just that the, something that always strikes me is when you look at the 2016 bond election, we promised not to raise the mill every for two years. And we did that for four. So effectively, that's, I'm reading that right, right? Or did we, did, we did it for... Cool. You, you can say that, uh, you know, that we're really on year five of not increasing the mill levy yeah. for that election. Now, we did have to increase it for the 2018 one. Right. But what we're dealing with today it has nothing to do. We actually have done it. There's been no increase with that 2016 bond election. Right. So we're on year five. We promised to. We've delivered five so far. And I think mm -hmm. that's due to your team, our administration, teachers, staff, everyone just being very cognizant of the dollars they're spending. Yep. I think that's a huge accomplishment. Um, I, yes. I think it's really important that we point that out. And then also, you know, we've added what, 108, 60 million or so in, in bonds, more than that, um, close to 200 million since 2003. And our bond or our mill levy is lower than it was in 2003. Yes. Again, I think that goes to strong, <laughs> focused fiscal management of tax dollars. And I got to give uh, Greg Varnberg a lot of credit. Um, he he spends a lot of time helping us, you know, look 20 years down the road and and uh, make sure that we don't get in a year where we're going to be. Um, challenged on cash flow that as we grow our payments grow with us and and we can meet our obligations without having to have huge increases to the mill levy uh he's been very good about um under promising and over delivering so <laughs> not a bad plan but anyway five years over are under are promised and then over delivered that yeah. that's a, right two years yeah no increase have gone for five years into it so far so yep I think it's important that we acknowledge those kind of successes when we have them. Yeah, the fact that, you know, that one slide where Gardner and DeSoto were in their heyday and really growing by six, 8% in enrollment, you know, they had mill levies in the 80s. Right. And, and uh, uh, we're growing just as fast as they were in, and we're in the 60s. Um, it's, it's, we've been very fortunate. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions? Well, we'll leave this open for the next 11 minutes and start our board meeting at seven o'clock. All right, thank you.
working together or to order. Um, please. Uh, um, Candy, please call a roll. Or Katie, or Katie's out the hall. Candy, please call a roll. Mrs. Sealing? Here. Mr. Hoffman? Here. Mr. Winbolt? Here. Mr. Updike? Present. Mrs. Mitchell? Here. Mr. Anderson? Here. We have a quorum. Very good. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. I'd like to move, um, propose that we move the discussion item 10.01 and 10.02 up to uh, before recognitions. Second. Um, I agree. So move to approve the agenda with the amendments of discussion items 10.01 and 10.02 to prior to recognitions. Second. Did you get the second? Yes. So move and second it to approve the agenda as amended. Uh, any other uh, changes or amendments? Candy, please collect the vote. We'll start the vote with Mrs. Sealing. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Winbolt. Yes. Mr. Updike. Yes. Mrs. Mitchell. Yes. Mr. Anderson. Yes. Approved. Very good. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Very good, and welcome everyone. Welcome board. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, we'll move on to the discussion item. We just moved the 10.01 Dazzler Dance Team, Dr. Burke. Yeah, I believe the Dancer Dazzler Dance Team wants to talk to you about attending nationals. So who do you have presenting to us? Hi, we're the Dazzlers. My name is Avery. I am a senior. I'm a senior. I've been on the team for three years and I'm an officer. I'm a captain. <laughs> oh, I see. Hi, I'm Maddie Olson. Um, I'm going to be a, I'm a senior this year. I've been on the dance team for around four years now and I am a captain. Hi, I'm Lily Wigington. I'm a sophomore. I'm a junior captain, and this will be my second year on this team. So we are positioning to go to the ADTS National Dance Competition. Um, it is Keisha approved event. Hosts are the American Dance Slash Drill Team. And it is on March 25th and 26th of 2022. We are traveling on March 24th and 27th. The location is in the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas. It is 340 miles from Kansas state border. Um, the Dazzler dance team consists of the nine dance team members both the head coach and the assistant coach, and one team manager. Um, the team statistics are 2021 to 2022, superior ratings on routines from NDA summer camp, technical excellent trophies, received a bid to NDA nationals attending two regional competitions, and the second annual Keisha State Championship. Since 2017, 17 top three placements for team routines, eight eight first place trophies, 13 top 10 soloists, six specialty awards, nine out of 12 graduated seniors have moved on to college level programs. The SHHS develop involvement football, we're involved in football, soccer, uh, basketball, and we attend soccer attendance and support marching band involvement as well. Community involvement, the community events bringing dance to younger students, awareness from 
the Lymphoma Society and Suicide Prevention Through Zero Reasons Why. Some of the benefits of um, attending nationals is representing the state of Kansas, the Spring Hill community and Spring Hill High School on a national level. Exposure to other teams and their dance styles from across the country, working on the teamwork, dedication and teammates trust that is needed for competing on a national level. And the reason why I wanna go to nationals this year is because I really trust this team and I think our bond is very strong and I wanna be able to show that to, I want, really wanna like show that to like other states and like other districts that just like we're a small county and I believe that we're more powerful than just a small county. Um, I really wanna go to nationals because I wanna represent this small town I want to like show that just because we're a small town doesn't mean that we're not like a force to be reckoned with that we're not like a strong dance team or a team at all like we're just like strong and I want to represent like Spring Hill and like our community and the students that go to every Spring Hill school that's why I want to go to Nashville. I want to go to nationals because I think it'll be really fun for our team and we'll really grow together, especially experiencing dancing with other teams from around the nation. I think we'll really benefit from this. So this is our financial overview. Fundraising costs are the competition entry fees, which is a thousand and a hundred dollars which is two team routines, which are $300 and $500 each. One officer routine, which is $310. Lodging is $1,450, which is at the Best Western Plus Denton. Three nights at $119 a night. Taxes may be exempt. Three rooms for four, four students and one room for coaches. Family cost consists of meals, which are $1,080. Breakfast is provided by hotel and $90 for students. Um, the request, dis request district cost consists of providing the 24 passenger bus for transportation and the bus driver expenses, which is 430, three nights at one, 109 a night and 100 for meals, the bus driver wage. Um, with COVID-19 acknowledgement, um, cancellation can be accepted by ADTS for a full refund up to um, 14 days prior to the competition. Hotel has a free cancellation policy and AT ADTS feels they can safely host this event in 2022. Um, um, they reevaluate the state of COVID between February 1st through the 9th to determine if cancellation is necessary. Thank you for your time. Is there any questions? Yeah, I have a question for the sponsors because originally the proposal was about two school suburbans and the gas. So when did this change? Um, so we had a issue with driving the suburban. So we talked over with the athletic director, Gary Howard, to find some alternatives for transportation. And he suggested a bus over flying. Um, so we just had some complications with uh, the trust in driving the Suburbans. So what's the cost going to be for that? Um, so that is, um, Mark and Gary didn't know what the bus driver wage was. So I apologize, that is an unknown amount at this time. Um, but they thought we should ask for the paying of the hotel room for the bus driver, which is 109 a night, and then approximately $100 for his or her meals. So what's the bus going to cost? Um, that was not indicated to me in any sort of meeting. So I am not aware of that cost, we're, unfortunately. We're going to need to know that. Yeah. Yep, I can definitely ask. Any other questions? Can't wait to watch you perform again. It's always fun. Good job, girls. You did a good job. No, you guys didn't get to go this past year, so I'm glad that we're going to try it again. Yes. Thank you. You have plenty of time. So to you'll get need ready. to yeah. get us those costs back to us so that we can have a complete picture of the final financial overview and as well as sponsors. 
for chaperones? Is that, how does that? Um, so that was the head and assistant coach, which is, um, my, my name is Bridge McBratney and this is Kelsey Stevie. She's our assistant coach. So we would be the chaperones. Okay. All right, very good. Any other questions? Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Moving on to the FFA National Convention, Dr. Burke. Yeah, we have a group that would like to go to Indianapolis. So we're going to turn it over to them. Uh, hi, I'm Ali Dickey. I'm the president of the Spring Hill FFA chapter. Um, I have brought a lot of <laughs> FFA members with me. Um, we could just go down the line. All right. Hi, I'm Haley Hodge. I am a junior and I am the reporter for FFA. My name is Jillian King and I'm the Sentinel. My name is Lydia Pierce. My name is Meredith Duncan, and I am the treasurer of the FFA chapter. My name is Cadence, and I am the junior advisor. Uh, my name is Aiden Smith, and I am the vice president of the chapter. My name is Santa King. My name is Ellie Wimble, and I'm a sophomore. My name is Dylan Ruger, and I am a sophomore. My name is Lillian Toy. <laughs> My name is Legacy Murphy. <laughs> My name is Michael Schick. And these are actually some of the kids that would be attending national convention. Um, ideally, there'd be 16, which they're going to present to you about. But um, these are the kids that I told them if they wanted to go, they needed to come and, and ask for that. So our president's going to lead a, or a presentation and has some more stuff going on. Yes, so um, this is our National FFA Convention, and we're going to start off with Haley. Okay, so at the Na National Convention every year, a, a bunch of FFA members from nationwide converge together in one place to celebrate all of our accomplishments and to find inspiration for our next steps in Indiana. Um, the benefits for us attending national convention, well, there would be exposure to 500 colleges and agricultural businesses at the Career Expo, standards aligned workshops taught by industry professionals, opp opportunity to mingle with FFA members from across the country. Uh, so there are many benefits to attending national convention. There are sessions celebrating the best and brightest of FFA. There are also many motivational speakers, and there have been many notable speakers in the past. There has been the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture and also the U.S. President at one point. Um, we have tours of agricultural businesses and also national days of service that can benefit the community. So we are taking proper COVID-19 uh, protocols where masks are required by the National FFA Convention while at National FFA sponsored events. Masks will be checked by security at the events and escorted out if not com in compliance. COVID-19 waiver completed by every single student and chaperone in attendance. Should it be canceled, we can be refunded our total cost. So it's in Indianapolis, Indiana. There are 16 members hoping to attend. We have 12 females and four males, three chaperones, two females and one male. We would leave October 26th, stay through the 30, 30th and then leave and return back in that afternoon. So some of the costs for the school district include two substitutes to cover Miss Hampton and Mr. Shockley's classes for Tuesday, October 26th through Friday, October 29th. 
Cost of fuel and use of three district suburbans for transportation would also be included. And I can cover that a little bit more. Um, I did provide a breakdown as well. Um, these kids uh, and our FFA alumni, which is basically our booster club, um, help with hotel rooms, which are the extreme expense for us because Indianapolis knows they have a monopoly on hotel rooms, so they jack up the prices. Um, but half of our um, hotel rooms are covered by our booster club. Um, and the kids pay $275 for the whole trip. And then they get obviously bring money for food. And I know that some of them bring a bunch of money for boots because Ariat discounts their boots. So they get very excited by that. Um, but uh, when we did the estimate, it depends on gas prices, but we spend anywhere from 200 to $250 in gas per suburban. So on the upper end of things, it ends up being about $750 that it costs the um, district for fuel and then the cost of the two substitutes. And so everything else would be provided by us in fundraising. Very good. Are there any questions for my lovely kiddos or myself? Has anybody gone before? That's what I was going to ask. Oh. Uh, only four. And four. a couple of them uh, who have not gone are seniors. So they they were a little bummed the last couple of years when we didn't get to go. And so uh, they're really looking forward to it. And they, I know that our president is actually that one of the seniors that has not gone that is uh, wanting to go. And I think they're willing to do just about anything to get to go to nationals. <laughs> so if that means they're like, you know, face shields and whatever, there'll be an official dress corduroy and face shields if it means they're going to national convention. Okay. Are you gonna participate in any competitions this year? We are not. Um, virtual contest was rough and I'm sure some of these kids can attest to that. Um, we got second by just a few points in two of our contests in the spring. So we did not get to attend as a com competing team. But that's also exciting because that means that we get to do more tours and more things that that time was filled with when we would normally compete. And I haven't gotten as an advisor to enjoy convention with them without competing in a couple of years. So I'm very excited for that as well. Very good. Any other questions from the board? It's a great opportunity. Yes, I'm glad they're having it. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank good. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming in. <clears throat> Moving on to our next agenda item is recognitions. Dr. Burke. Yeah, I will start. Um, Eric Boyle, uh, we did ask him to be here tonight, and uh, I talked to Katie, and I believe there was a job change and some conflicts that he couldn't make. Anytime a board member leaves us, we want to give them a token of our appreciation. Uh, Mr. Boy was with us over 20 years, and so we certainly appreciate. So we do have an award of excellence for the community to look at. It's pretty nice. And so again, we wanted to say a very heartfelt thank you. Uh, for people who don't know, our school board members do not get paid a salary. Uh, every once in a while, we feed them uh, a sandwich or two, but other than that, that's all that they receive. We do tell them every year that, that we add another zero to their salary. That means it can be at the beginning or the end. And so certainly appreciate it, but appreciate Mr. Boyle's 20 years of service. And so with him leaving, I believe Mr. Anderson is the next longest serving member. And this is year 18 for you, is that correct? So, so certainly want to take an opportunity and say thank you. And we will get this to him. Yeah, I think about 20 years of service on the board um, and just the changes we've gone through. We just had a budget hearing that talked about, uh, it went back to 2003 when we were going through the struggles with, uh, with uh, getting bond issues passed and, 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 and budgets. And, and Eric was here through that on this board. He saw a lot of, a lot of change, a lot of advancement. Um, had a lot of great contributions to the district um, on a personal and a, a board level. He at one point taught in our district. Um, so he knew, knew the district from two different perspectives, which brings a lot of value to a board. But it was, it was an honor serving with him. He did bring a lot of value. He, uh, he was a good mentor for me in the beginning when I didn't know anything. It was, uh, 
taught me to be a better listener and he helped me out a lot. So I really appreciate the time he was here. Okay, next, Spring Hill High School, Mr. Mark Williams. Good evening, it's great to see you guys this evening. Um, I'm gonna be pretty short and sweet. I would like to take time to recognize my staff. Um, I get the opportunity to work with some wonderful educators some tireless workers. Um, they have taken our strategic plan uh, that was presented to them, finalized at the beginning of the year, and they have really uh, taken off. We've actually made some progress on some of our goals for this year. Um, I can't thank Giselle McDonald enough for her time and effort of creating a very focused professional development at the beginning of the school year, focused towards our goal for this year and on our strategic plan. Teachers did a great job implementing those within those classrooms and just very fortunate. So I'd like to give a shout out to, to the staff at the high school. Thank you. Trevor Gerson, Spring Hill Middle School. Good evening. As a former FFA guy of four years, I'm so grateful that FFA uh, continues on here in Spring Hill because it did so, so much for me. So it's just, it's always fun for me to see those kids and I can still wear my jacket and yeah. actually still fit. So I have it in my closet. Um, recognition wise, first off, uh, Helen Cutis, a school nurse, she's taken on a whole new world of challenges this year. Uh, with some of the difficulties that we're facing, but she takes on with grace and courage each day and has a positive attitude serving our kids through everything we do. And then our front office ladies, we are down a front office gal right now with Michelle Harris being out. She'll be back with us and I think like 14, 15 days, not that we're counting, but we're excited to get her back. And so since then, Amy Duncan and Brittany Dutton have both stepped up huge to really help keep, up, keep our building moving in a productive way. And so just want to say thank you to those three ladies. I think uh, Mr. Sprague, are you doing it for Mr. Sprague? Okay. Uh, I think Mr. Sprague is home ill. So with that, we will turn it over to Wolf Creek Elementary School, Beth Cooper. Good evening. I think I might do this at every September board meeting, but I just have to recognize Sandy Lancelotti and Christy Weber this evening. Um, they've had additional challenges, as have all of our front office folks, because kids were coming and going from various types of education this year. We also have that added piece of the PLC registration. And to make sure that that's done carefully so all of our children are safely delivered to the right place on our first couple of Wednesdays is actually a lot of work. Also, they are willing to jump in and do everything. Last week, they were helping serve lunch. So just wanted to give a shout out to them. They are definitely women that wear many hats, and I'm very grateful to them tonight. Hey, Timber Sage uh, Elementary School. This is Mika Bauer. I think your first presentation to the board. It is this evening. Um, I would like to say thank you for um, having me here today. First of all, um, I would like to recognize our front office team at Timber Sage, um, Ms. Danielle Ecker and Ms. Sarah Guider. Um, not only did they make sure that our building was up and running for a new school year, but as a new principal, um, they've had a lot of extra work on their hand to make sure that I am ready to go every single day of the week. Uh, they take care of our staff, our students, our families, and principals across our district and all of our front offices every day. Um, the energy that these ladies bring um, to our building is just amazing. And our theme this year is Rise Up to Excellence, and they really are a model of excellence, the Ranger way, um, every day when they come to work. So thank you for your time. Prairie Creek Elementary School, this is Jody Cole. Good evening. I would like to recognize our Guiding Coalition team. They worked really hard to provide a successful PLC kickoff. Uh, the team reviewed the PLC process, the district expectations, and our building mission and vision statements. The Guiding Coalition team also created a Google Classroom where grade level teams can review the teacher's clarity modules from our book study last year. This is um, this week during PLC, our grade level teams will begin unpacking the reading standards. Uh, I appreciate this team's attention to detail and um, I wanna thank them for a job well done. Thanks. Uh, Spring Hill Elementary, Tammy Endicott, don't see her. So we'll go with uh, Dayton Creek and Darcy Sly. Good evening. Tonight, I want to recognize some ladies that have been helping us. As you know, with Dayton Creek opening, we also opened up our autism program there at Dayton Creek, and that has been an undertaking. And I have some ladies that have really helped out in that area. Um, our speech teacher, um, Sarah Lewis, and our 
School psych, Maggie Cook, <laughs> and Lexi Mangan, our occupational therapist, have stepped up and have stepped into that classroom time and time again to help out with these students. Um, if I'm ever looking for them, I noted just to go to that classroom because any spare moment that they have in the day of their own free time, they're in there helping and, and trying to make it the best program that it can be. And I also want to say thank you to Cindy Jottos because she has spent a good amount of time helping me and the, those ladies and the teacher make this a program that's um, something that we're very proud of. And she even spent the day today in the classroom, uh, in that classroom, the teacher had to be gone. And as you know, an autism program, those students need a special type of teacher and we don't have a trained substitute. And so she stepped up and came in and spent the morning with us. So she was in the classroom all morning and it was fun to, to be able to be there with her during that time. And I wanna say thank you for that. So they're doing a great job, thank you. And I see Stephanie Barnhill in the queue for, she's from the Spring Hill Early Learning Academy. Good evening. I'd like to recognize the entire Spring Hill Early Learning Academy team. Every day they demonstrate a dedication and passion for working with our youngest scholars. This year we are wild about learning and the students will spend the year exploring nature's habitats. The team puts an extraordinary amount of time, effort, and imagination into creating new and engaging learning environments, and the students enter each day excited to see what new learning experiences have been created just for them. On my daily visits in the classroom, I am continually amazed at the ingenuity of the staff in creating everything from volcanoes to apple orchards. This is a wonderful team that deserves to be recognized for all they do for our students. Thank you. We have anything from any of the other directors? I did want to recognize Doug Swin, those of you who weren't here early, uh, incredible amount of time and energy that went into our budget. Uh, I can tell you that he uh, basically goes into his office and we're not sure he comes out for a few days. And uh, the fact that uh, we've added millions and millions of dollars of, a, of assessed value to the district and we're able to continue to uh, have our budget for next year with no mill levy increase is just stunning. Those of you who heard me, I started telling you probably back in April to expect a mill levy increase. And due to his work and dedication, and I know that he also had some assistance from Brad Wilson, it's just amazing that we're able to do that. So I wanted to recognize Doug and his staff. With that, we'll turn it over to you. Very good. Thank you. It's always good to Hear the hear about the positive things and people stepping up. I love the um, what was it the uh, rise up to excellence. I think it's an excellent standard to set for people to think about and keep in the forefront of their mind as they come into school every day. It's a it's a great uh, uh, vision to have or mission to have. So I, very good. I'd, I'd like to also say um, I I want to acknowledge the appreciation of the, the secretarial administration staff from our principals. They um, custodial staff as well. They they're lifesavers in um, school buildings, and uh, teachers wouldn't survive without them. So, I uh, I really appreciate that. And as far as Sandy Lancy Lotti, um, I've known her for a long time, and I don't know what Wolf Creek would be or Spring Hill Elementary. <laughs> whenever I first met her, would do without her. So thank you. Very good, moving on to uh, public participation. I do have two cards um, just for those that are, will come up and, and participate in, in, in the public participation part on our agenda. Uh, know that we'll set a limit of, we, we set a standard limit of three minutes. Uh, the board clerk will provide you updates as how you're moving along with that, uh, within that, time period. Um, I'd also remind you that the board won't hear personal or personal complaints concerning any student employee or groups of students or employees of the school district during open session. Uh, all student and personnel matters are uh, referred to administration and handled by the board within an executive session. Um, with that, we'll start with the first card that we received was from Marvin Schaefer. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, the reason I'm here is uh, we've been crunching the numbers on uh, 
COVID cases within the uh, Spring Hill School District. And we seem to be tracking considerably higher than the other school districts in the county. Um, as you'll see in front of you, you have some numbers. They're pretty self-explanatory. Another gentleman will explain some of those numbers. We pulled our handouts. But um, as we know, we uh, came up with this medical exception for masks, the one proven thing to reduce the spread of COVID, um, minus the vaccine. So I'll, I'll form it like this. 20% uh, of the students from our last check was uh, had filed for medical exceptions of the elementary K, uh, K through six. The other 80% had not. So 80% of the parents want their kids to come to school and be safe, right? And we're ignoring the 80% for the 20%. Just my personal opinion on that. Um, so the, I'm gonna start with a few questions. Uh, what are we going to do to bring those numbers down more in line with what the other districts are seeing? Because we're way, ab we're way ahead of them by percentage of population. So um, and then the other things I want to get into is the vaccine is now FDA approved. Will there be a vaccine for the teachers? A mandate. I already know that the government has mandated that. Are we going to do the home rule on that as well? Or will we get the vaccine for their teachers, protect our teachers, which in turn will protect our students? It is FDA approved now. So next question is, FDA approved for kids 16 and older. Will we be getting the children 16 and older vaccine uh, you know, mandated to take the vaccine? Now we're in emergency authorization for kids at 12 to 16. So, you know, understanding there's not an FDA approval there yet, will we, once that FDA approval comes, will we mandate the vaccine for those children? And eventually the same question carries on. Will we mandate that vaccine once it's FDA approved from five to 12? What is the board's position on that? And then also I'd like to say, uh, I would like to see some enhancements to the dashboard. We are not seeing quarantines. There is no quarantine numbers on that dashboard and the rest of the districts provide that information. So, and the other thing I sent a note to the web designer, I'd like to see hospitalizations and deaths because I know there has been some hospitalizations. So we would love to see that. All right, that's all I have. Um, thank you. Uh, next up, our second card is from John Schultz. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I did want to build a little bit on what he was talking about with the dashboard um, in particular. I do think, and we had talked about what well, we had heard you guys talk about empowering parents being uh, very important to the district. So providing information on students who, if not in quarantine, should be in quarantine would be uh, a good addition to the dashboard. I think it'd also be great if uh, if we would have a better sense uh, more frequently of how many students are actually exempting out of masks. Um, again, if that's a, if it's about empower, empower, yeah, empowering parents, that would help us to, uh, to understand a little bit more what we're sending our children into. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, I, I've got a student who's in quarantine right now, a uh, middle school student. Um, the learning options for students who are being put into quarantine need to improve. Uh, I mean, frankly, you know, I know my student doesn't have to quarantine, but I'm not a big fan of being a free rider. And so I am actually having my student quarantine as recommended, as strongly recommended, but there's been no outreach to them outside of emails that he sends to teachers. There isn't really a system for the students who are choosing to quarantine. And if we want this thing to not continue to get out of control, and right now, I mean, it's a, you know, just the, 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 the back of the envelope math on the, uh, uh, on the various, um, dashboards would indicate what we're about four times as likely for our students to be testing positive in a blue valley uh, we have as many positive students as blue valley does that's a much larger district uh, we're about twice as likely to have our students testing positive as olefa um so for if we're going to you know continue without masks if we're going to basically continue 
um, to basically make uh, quarantines optional when it's recommended by the county that we do do quarantines. We have to expect that there's going to be more students who are going into it. So I would ask that there is more done for those students, basically, uh, as, they, as they get through things. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, those are the only cards I had, Katie, one or two. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the information. Uh, moving on to uh, the consent agenda, which consists of approval of the consent agenda, approval of the minutes of the August 23rd meeting, approval of the minutes of the workshop meeting from August 30th, and personnel. Mr. President, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Let's move in second to approve the consent agenda um, as stated. Any final questions or comments? Katie, please collect the vote. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Wimble? Yes. Mr. Updike? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. And Mrs. Sealing? Yes. Very Approved. good, thank you. Moving on to agenda items, approval of the budget for 2020, 2021-2022. Yeah, uh, you heard uh, the presentation by Mr. Swint, and uh, we feel like, hey, this is a great budget, especially the fact that we're not raising the mill levy, and we are asking the board to approve the budget for the 21-22 school year. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the budget for the 2021-2022 school year as presented. Second. It's moved and seconded to approve the 2021-2022 uh, budget as presented. Any final questions or comments? Katie, please collect the vote. Mr. Wimble? Yes. Mr. Updike? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Sealing? Yes. And Mr. Hoffman? Yes, and Perfect. thank you, Doug. Yeah, thank you, Doug. There's it's a, definitely, lot, it's, a lot it's, that goes in. It's good to see our melody basically flat, a little lower, but basically flat. It's, it's great work. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Moving on to our second agenda item is Water One, Water One, Water Main Extension Agreement. Dr. Burke? That's a lot of W's in there. A lot of water. Sandra, can I request something? Can we go through all of these things from Water One as a whole, or do we want to separate? I know we have to approve them essentially separately, but can we go through them as a whole, or do they need to be separate? You you have to vote on them separately. Right. Yeah, right. I mean they're all they're all tied together, but you have to go. Because so I think we all, can have a discussion in a total time. around all right. of them, and then we have do we do have to vote on each each one. Yep. There's yeah. there's individual agreements for each one, yep. so they. Have, but I think we can talk about them in in total. So let, Tim, let me jump in, and then Tim, you jump in whenever. So when we brought it to you as a discussion item, it's still one discussion item. There's just four parts to it. Uh, the first part is we have to add about 970 foot to add to a water main, that's going to cost us about $70,000. So that's the first part. We have to pay for that to, to move part of that. Uh, normally we don't have to do this, but because it, it's usually absorbed by the developer, but we are the developer in this case, You know, we, we own the land. The second part is we are taking over the easement uh, because, of, because of the same project. And so we're, we're absorbing that easement. The third part of it, the benefit area, uh, this is going to be cost a little bit more. It's $32,934 because this is getting the water supply to middle school number three. So even though we have to hook up to the water line, we still have to pay to get the water slot supply in. And there's lots of maps on here. And then the last part of that is for the, la the water benefit district MX 07027BA is $2,479. Uh, we have to uh, basically hook on to that for the additional 
um, help me with that one, Tim. Well, it's, they're all tied to how the water is transported to that site. Uh, the, the larger one is a newer water uh, benefit district that's we front quite a little bit on 191st, and that's the one on 191st. And because we, it's on that part of it, and the water is transported through it, we get a share based on the acreage we have, and uh, all of that. The next one, uh, the next benefit district, the second one that the smaller one is an older water uh, one benefit district, and it has had quite a few people already hook onto it. Um, and it's a much shorter distance. It was only in front of uh, the one area. So the other one's a half mile long. I think this one's like a quarter mile long, uh, but it was done back before we even built Wolf Creek. Uh, again, most of the time, these are all things that are, are paid for by us in one way or another because the developer has already paid them. Uh, we just don't see them, but because we are the developer in this instance, we get to, we get to see them and pay for them uh, with a check, so. <coughs> do, we, do we get some offset from people that tie into it later? On the that's one that's in the, we, we will not, this is repay, the, the two benefit districts that we're buying into, we won't get anything back out of that. But the one that that uh, is feeding, it's only feeding into the, the development. So once it gets in the development, it's no longer considered a, uh, can't think of the, the right word, but it's no longer considered part of the main supply or main the main part for the rest of the the you know, only people in that development will be tying on to 193rd Street. It won't continue on down and and tie into another development the way Water One has it. It's only sized to continue on for Wolf Creek. So, and if we want to do it, we have to do it for the right size to do it. So, uh, it, it gets kind of. The way I was explained by the engineer, it's only if you're on the main uh, 191st Ridgeview, those type of areas where they're running a water main, or if they choose to run a larger main through the middle of your development, that's going to be serving multiple developments or multiple tracts of land. Then, yeah, you can set up a benefit district. But okay. uh, you maybe already mentioned this, and I might have missed it, but is it was this figured into the budget? Yeah, that was it was part of the figure that we had in at the very beginning. So okay, where, where's it? Is it going right to the school? Or where, where's it coming from? It's running it? along 190. It, it starts just um, a little bit west of the 193rd Street entrance to Wolf Creek. Just it'll halfway down the fence or so, right where the road <laughs> stops there. Uh, and then it'll run all the way to the extension in the map. In one of the maps there, it shows oh. going all the way along and, and basically to the far drive of our school on the west side. It's map number okay. 10 on that. Yeah. Uh, okay, got it. The easement's going to be, yes, uh, where the line's going. The other thing to note is the water main extension, the cost there is an estimate. Um, Water One did include some rock excavation in that uh, amount because they don't want to be surprised later, but everything we put in, we've been putting in the sanitary sewer, which always is much deeper than the rock, than the, the uh, water main. And we have not hit rock in that area right there for the sanitary sewer. And anything we've hit on site has been, has been diggable. So it's not been uh, anything that's been, would take a lot. So in the depth that they're going to be going, uh, we shouldn't hit any rock at that because it's kind of up on the <laughs> plateau of that you know, hill there. So we should we should see some savings. So okay. the other thing with Water One that you may not know is they have one contractor, and that is the only contractor that can put in their water mains. So Ron Weir Construction is who they have bid out. I don't know if they bid it out what their vetting process is, I would assume they have to because they're a public entity. They bet it out and, and gotten this price from them, but they are the only one allowed to do it. So we can't, we can't ask our contractor, hey, could you give us a better price? We have vetted the numbers through our contractor and through JE Dunn to make sure that they're, they're legitimate costs, not something out of the ordinary, so.
Any other questions? I mean, it sounds like we're doing four different things, right? We're we're extending a main, mm -hmm. right? Down so that we can get water down into middle school number three. The second is we're providing the easement. For that main. That's the, the second thing. And then there were really joining two benefit districts. Yes. Uh, two existing benefit districts. So yeah. those have been in place by the developer and we're just buying into that benefit district. Is yeah, that two different. Yeah, the one is the Wiswell, one that's on, on Ridgeview that they they paid for a long time ago. Uh, and then the other ones was paid by, it's what what is Summit Homes. They've got a larger corporate name that they're, uh, okay. That we're joining that one too on 191st Street. So, so each one has its own agreement that we have to that we have to, to buy in. and a cost to, associated. Yeah, except the easement, I guess. But. Yeah, the easement has no right. technical cost to it. So okay, the benefit district is that based on land amount? Based on land amount, uh, the size of pipe that you're pulling off of it. There are multiple calculations that that go into it. Uh, the road frontage we have along 191st because we're the closest to it. The further removed you get from a from a pipe, even though our water is going to be coming off 193rd, the fact that we own land on 191st and we're going to be serving it off of water that'll run through there allows us the opportunity to join that benefit district. So allows us the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I think I used that. <laughs> Got it. Love it. Any questions for Tim? Mr. President, I move that the board approve the water main extension and petition agreement MX21020 with water district number one of Johnson County at an estimated cost of $70,030. Second the motion. It's moved and seconded to approve the water main extension petition agreement uh, MX21020. Uh, any questions or comments? Katie, please collect the vote. Mr. Updick? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Sealing? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Winbold? Yes. Approved. Very good. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the permanent easement for public water main unto water district number one of Johnson County. Second motion. It's moved and second to approve the permanent easement for public the uh, public water main um, as presented. Any final questions or comments? Katie, please collect the vote. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Sealing? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Winbolt? Yes. And Mr. Updike? Yes. Approved. Mr. President, I move that the board approve joining the Water One benefit area for a water main extension designated MX 18006BA at a cost of $32,934.80. Um, this would be for water supply to middle school number three. Second the motion. It's moved and seconded to uh, approve joining uh, Water One benefit. District Area MX 18006BA. Uh, any final questions or comment? Katie, please collect the vote. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Sealing? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Winbolt? Yes. Mr. Updike? Yes. And Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Approved. Mr. President, I move the board approve joining Water One Benefit Area for a water main extension designated. MX 07027 BA at a cost of $2,479.12. Water supply for middle school number three. I'll second the motion. It's moved and seconded to approve uh, Water One Benefit, uh, joining Water One Benefit District Area MX 07027 BA. Any final questions or comment? I'm getting really good at reading out loud. <laughs> Katie, please collect the vote. Yeah. Mrs. Sealy? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Winbolt? Yes. Mr. Updike? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. 
And Mr. Anderson. Yes. Approved. Very good. Thank you. Uh, moving on to discussion items, uh, moving straight to 10.03 bond construction update, Dr. Burke. Since uh, Tim is here, we're gonna turn it over to Tim Meek. All right, thanks for not making me walk back to the seat and, and set between another, yeah, so we'll go right on into, I'll let Bill's getting it opened up here for me. Uh, while it opening, you will notice that we did make the change that we approved a, a uh, meeting or two ago on the uh, to the contingency. So uh, that'll be kind of the first thing you'll you'll see here is uh, uh, change the contingency, moving the uh, amount of twenty seven thousand three hundred thirty two dollars for the change order for the masonry bracing uh, to that, so leaving us a contingency balance of three hundred seventy two thousand dollars. So. Dayton Creek Elementary School, quickly, uh, we got the permanent occupancy here last week, so uh, we're no longer on a TCO. Uh, still working on some site landscaping, some grass growing and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm daily talking to them, pushing them to get there before we lose our growing window for, for grass. Right now is perfect time, so I'm hoping uh, that they'll be here in the next week or so to, to get that sowed. So. Uh, the middle school number three, um, still working on uh, masonry walls, almost done with pouring the concrete slabs. There are just a few pours left there. Um, here, the middle of next month, maybe just a little earlier, we'll be beginning the steel framing, um, exterior sanitary sewer and storm line installations continuing. Um, still working on the public improvements on 192nd, 193rd in the, in the little bit of public improvements you see there on 191st Street too, there by the 191st Street entrance. One thing I, that is in um, board docs there, along with my presentation, is a, another easement that Evergy is going to give to us, that, that they've actually given to us. I got it uh, late Friday evening uh, from them. And that'll be for our electrical service um, into the building as well. We've already got those lines ran, so they were able to go ahead and get the survey crews out and get that all done. So at the next meeting, uh, I'll be coming back with you for another easement to have the electrical service. And that basically runs, just to give you a real quick idea, it runs across the north fence of Wolf Creek. It joins right where the driveway, the bus loop goes back there. It joins right there, runs along the fence there gets to the parking lot of the new middle school and cuts across straight across into the, to the mechanical area, electrical, it's all below grade. So uh, Evergy did try to sneak in again that they could put poles and other things in it, but we, we sent it back to them and said, no, you, you can't have poles above ground and everything. Everything's gotta be below ground. They didn't plan to, but in all their easements, they automatically put that in. And if you don't ask them to take it out, uh, they would at some point have the right to come in and do that if we didn't have them take it out. So we took that out. Uh, challenge successes, BART's, uh, the electrical contractor, their under slab, they've been staying well ahead of our, our concrete pours and getting everything done. Uh, challenges, uh, Delta, their roofing insulation availability, um, still, a, still an issue. We're still looking at right close to the end of the year before roofing uh, materials will show up as far as the insulation, the poly ISO. Um, the insulation of the masonry and wall bracing has started as well. Um, you can see the gym walls go up every day. You can, now, if you drive by, you can start to see them from the road and stuff too. So um, 137 days, no lost time accidents on that site. Just a couple of pictures, uh, views from the Southwest two different days, uh, the track curb and drains. We've started work on the uh, uh, bleacher area and stuff for that building, uh, putting in the foundations and stuff that that will set on. Uh, there's the box culvert uh, there off 191st. 
and 192nd road extension, the, all the gradings done, all the gravels done, we're, we're actually ready there for that one to have curb and asphalt. Uh, but we won't be doing that until we get 193rd Street ready and 191st Street. We want to do them all at once so we don't pay another mobilization uh, from the contractor to come back and do it. So. Other construction and maintenance projects that are non-bond related. Uh, the solar panel project, um, we have received all of the technical stuff, uh, kind of surprising. The one thing that we've, we've been waiting on and haven't yet got is the pole uh, solar panels to set on. Uh, and so they are supposed to be here, I believe it's, uh, the very first week of October, if I'm not mistaken, and um, they'll start pounding them in the ground at that point, and and uh, early November, uh, early to middle of November, hopefully we'll be able to fire it up and and start pulling power off of it. So at this point, that's our timeline. So. Tim, is it related to that project that they have going on behind the school there? Yeah, that is uh, that is what you see, the digging going on behind the school, uh, right along the, the service road to the back and down to the football field. That is all part of that. That's where the, that's where the power is running from the solar project across there and into the building right on the east face of the uh, kitchen area there. So uh, another couple of pictures of, you can see the inside, the disconnect and other parts are there and ready to go. So they're, they're real close. We've got to find the right day to shut off power and, and time so we can shut the power off and get everything hooked up there. So uh, roof repairs at the Insight School of Kansas at the 101 East South Street. Uh, they have started that now, if you've been by there. Um, they're right now they're in demo mode, getting all the gravel and stuff like that off of the building. Um, and uh, they should be starting on the putting back uh, just in a couple of days. They'll start actually taking it down to the steel decking and, and bring it back. Luckily, I think this is a small enough job. They had insulation available in their yard to, to do it, or this could be another one of those. Let's wait six months to to do it. So right now that is a lead time we're hearing uh, for the poly ISO insulation that most construction companies are using. So, or most so, construction so I'm guessing we have that already ordered for uh, middle school number three. Yeah, we probably ought to order for elementary school number six at this point if we could, <laughs> the way things are going, but uh, we don't know. So what it will be. But. It is, it is the, that and the fasteners for the roofing insulation are the two hardest things to get right now. Um, one company, uh, I won't name its name, uh, supplies most of the fasteners and there's kind of a shortage of them. And so they also supply roofing material. They're a roofing manufacturer. And they've said, if you use our material, we'll get you fasteners for it. We'll, and they're keeping it all for their, which is probably a smart move for them in the short term. In the long term, uh, they're probably going to lose a bunch of, from what I've talked to contractors, they're going to lose a lot of people. Uh, they're going to find other sources and they're mad enough that they don't want to go back to them. You know, when they, when they bid something and said, we'll supply it for you. And then they're saying, no, we won't. So, um, the other two projects that are really their city of Spring Hill projects, just uh, we're constantly monitoring and talking to the city. Uh, the roundabout, uh, most of you, a lot of you may have driven through it on, well, maybe have driven through it always, but when it's been open a couple of times and, and even when it hasn't been, there's been several people driving through it always, but, uh, uh, but the North South on Ridgeview has been open now for about a week and, and, uh, and, uh, they're got half the over half the light poles up now, and that's what they're waiting on is to get full lighting in that area. The city says they're hopeful to have it done. Talking to them by the end of this week or early next week. So 
uh, was their last time frame they give us. So the other deal there is the Webster Street project. Uh, we received notice today that the on Thursday that they're going to be switching from southbound, yeah, southbound to the northbound on phase, which will be called for, phase four for them. Uh, originally, they said they'd have us, they'd keep one, uh, act, what, give us one access into Spring Hill Elementary School for that side. And we said, no, that doesn't work for us. And, and he says, well, you only need the north one. They said, no, we need something on our south parking lot as well. And our buses have to get in as well. And so we talked to them and got them and let them understand what they've got to supply for there. So uh, they've been receptive and, and the contractor has been working with us well uh, to make sure we can get our people in and out and, and all as well. So that's it. Any questions? I got three of them. Okay. Um, is there any update on the steel for the middle school number three? The we've we've kind of shifted gears a little bit. Uh, the steel for the classroom wing uh, is going to be shipping early October, um, and we should by about the tenth of October, roughly that time frame, be starting to put the steel up on that part of the building. The long span joist, which has been the long lead time, we're still looking for early December. For the gym area and and uh, auditorium area is the other area that has that long span steel, okay. um, but we can get the other steel. So we want to go ahead and let the erection crews get started putting the rest of the building together. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> so it's still it, there's no changes to the timeline of when we're going when it's getting done. No, so, there's not. Uh, okay, not still, at this point. Not so. same. Yeah, we've had to look at the one, the one thing with the roofing we've had to look at is there's a couple of mechanical rooms that we're looking at, at an alternate way of just putting down our, our basically put down a jip board down and then put some roofing materials on it to dry those in, do a temporary, uh, cheap temporary roof over a couple of mechanical rooms so we can continue to start getting electrical in and get the temporary electrical service and, and some of that into the building so we can be ready to go and because some areas we don't want equipment to get wet. So that's probably the one thing we're doing to help with the roofing shortage. So, okay. Um, question two, um, who's covering in the cost of the crop damage for the solar project? Is that what are we doing there? <coughs> you know, we, I think we talked to, um, yeah, I, I've farmer. talked to uh, Gutterman's and we just told them that, they would just have less crops that they would be able to, they, we uh, crop share with them. Oh, okay. So they, okay. they would have just less amount of acreage that they could use. use yeah. the land. And they chose to go ahead and plant it all because they didn't know how much it was. I mean, before they planted, we told them where we were going to be at and what we were going to do. Oh, you did. Because so. okay. I can't tell how many acres yeah. of beans that used to be. There's about five acres. Is it five? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, they may come and say, hey, would you give us, you know, Additional for what they lost. I'm not sure what you know, Dr. Burke. I know Gettermans about. have been good. We'll work yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we might we might cover two thirds because one third of it would have been ours anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The last question is the box culvert on a 191st. 91st. Is that going to turn into a turning lane? Yeah, that's a turning lane into our school. That was a requirement okay. of the building there. So yeah, <laughs> that's why it's. We're widening widening it there for a turn lane. So. Yeah, I thought so. I just didn't take time to pull the map up. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Good report. Things moving forward. No schedule changes, even when we're having troubles with materials. That's just a quick question, kind of unrelated. Does the railroad give you guys any? Indication of when they're going to close the railroad? <laughs> no, no. 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 no, they they kind of work. Uh, they're the railroad, so they kind of work. That's, uh, that's what I thought the answer was. <laughs> that's been a little crazy. They don't even tell the city of Spring Hill that they're closing down. Mm. Because they're the railroad. All right, moving on to 
Hmm. Discussion item 10.04, <laughs> request for mask mandate exemptions to be put on the district dashboard. Yeah, I've had probably, I don't know, eight to 10 parents ask that we put the number of mask exemption forms to be posted on the, the dashboard. Um, since we kind of already discussed the, uh, the dashboard at the board meetings, I didn't feel like this is something that I could go uh, put this in. Uh, some of the reasoning, and you heard a parent tonight, uh, percentage of students unmasked in the building, which is a higher risk of spreading illness if infected, helps parents make decisions. So that's what I'm uh, hearing. Uh, I've had a couple of people say we, we should know this information, and we've had some other people that say it would help them make uh, decisions uh, for their child. And so... I felt like this is something that I needed to bring to the board and see what your thoughts were. And we would not be putting, if the board so moved to do this, it would be basically the percentage of by school. It would not be, we do not use names. We'd never do that anyway. And so I know that there was concerns about individuals names showing up and that's not something that we'd be, we would do. But with that, I would, I felt like I needed to bring it to you and see what your thoughts were. I, um, I'll go first. I think that we need to protect the integrity of the data on the dashboard and the mask exemptions are not definitive or conclusive, meaning that we might have so many people that have signed an exemption for their child for a medical exemption. However, we don't know if those children are, like for example, a parent that many of us have heard from, her child has anxiety. And so she signed the exemption, but 99% of the time her child is wearing a mask. So she just wants the ability to be able to take it off if she's feeling very anxious. So we don't really know out of even the people that have signed a mask exemption, who's actually wearing one. Maybe they're wearing one today and maybe not tomorrow. And I think in order to, to preserve the integrity of the data, it needs to be definitive data only on the dashboard. I think that becomes very confusing, so. And I do think they could even call, they can talk to their principal. They can talk, if they're concerned about their child, I mean, their principal or their teacher. Or, um, and quite frankly, they can ask, I mean, I've got three kids and three buildings and they can ask their kids. I can ask my kids at any time, how many people does it seem like are in your class? You know, they know, the kids are in there all day long and they know. I want to be careful though, because you said they could call their principal. I right now, I much. don't think our principals are giving out that information. Okay. So I don't want that to go out publicly to say you can call your principal because we're not yeah. necessarily sharing that information. Some classrooms may only have one or two kids in it. Right. And if we were to give that information out, it would be pretty definitive of who those children are. That's true. And we definitely don't want any children singled out at all. So then I guess I put my parent hat on for a minute. What would I do with the data knowing all of Woodland Spring or all of Prairie Creek Elementary School and my kid is, especially Prairie Creek is in just mostly one classroom. They do, and because they're not masked when they're on the playground or at lunch anyway, when they're with the other classrooms, nobody is. So I, I'm not sure, I just wanna be sure that we're really careful with the dashboard and there's already, you know, people that are critical of things on the dashboard. And so I want to be sure that we kind of protect the integrity of the dashboard and that it is actual data. Well, it would, you know, it would be actual data. They're just asking for a gross number of people who have exemptions. We, we wouldn't define who has a medical exemption, who has a parent exemption. It's just a, that's my interpretation. Yeah, just, of the a percentage percentage of just a percentage who, of people who, percentage of students. Requires. That number is the number. It's the, it's the number of exemptions we've received. And that would be accurate. There's just to clarify, good. we've had had parents that wanted to know they wanted to break down of mask exemptions signed by doctors and mask exemptions signed by parents. Yeah. So I think it's a mask exemption. Yeah. If they included it, it's yeah, it's the it's the same result, right? Yeah, an exemption is an exemption. Um because well, and, and the thing is, is I mean we've designated as it's all in one exemption. Um, and having, I would rather have percentages, not actual numbers, um, but the, the percentage at each building, if we're gonna do this, and, and I could go either way, but um, 
It is definitive data. You know, they've signed the waiver or the exemption. It's a number. We can put the percentage of students at that building that have that waiver. Um, I don't think it hurts the integrity of the dashboard if we have hard numbers. Um, we just won't know every day what who's doing what, but we know exactly how many exemptions we have. Well, and so the whole idea, though, was so to help parents make a decision. So if I'm thinking like as a mom, how, how would that help me make a decision if I don't really, I know how many in the class could possibly, mm -hmm. but I don't know right. how many actually well, are. We're just talking Whereas, building wide, though. I mean, right. But then, uh, but what really are they going to do with that? I mean, mm -hmm. and or is it just more divisive? Is it more what? Divisive. Is it? Just I don't think more... it's divisive. I think it's just people wanting to know the information. They're asking for transparency on number of exemptions that they have. Sorry, that's. I think that's that's how I interpret the. And so then we would update it weekly with additional exemptions that are signed, or we would, or it would just be what we had the first couple of weeks. I mean, how does what does that look like? If we were to do this, we would update it on Tuesdays and Fridays, like we do the regular. So it would be another thing that we're asking staff to do. Yeah. I'd rather I'd rather support something that actually makes a difference rather than whether some kids have an exemption or other kids aren't wearing it correctly or some kids are wearing it correctly and about we put on uh, who who takes vitamin D and zinc supplements every day. I mean, let's so let's we put have something mandated, on there that actually it matters. It does something. We haven't said that people have to take vitamin C and zinc. That's the difference. I think it's a recommend. It should be a recommendation. Um, and it doesn't matter. People are asking for it. They, they view that as me important to them to help them make a decision to know basically the maximum number of students that would be would not be wearing a mask in their school. I mean, that, that's and that's the, the decision of the board was to do that. And so it was, it's based on being transparent on the data that uh, of a decision that the board made. I'm all for transparency. I don't think it's not being transparent. Like I said, they can ask their students, they can talk to their kids, they can understand what their actual classroom really looks like. I don't know what difference it makes what the entire school percentage looks like to a parent. I mean, elementary school, I mean, our unofficial numbers were 36, 86, right? So elementary school is a lot less than that because about a thousand are in the high school. What, what as, as a parent, what would I look at that and think this is helping me to make a decision? Do you what, have to what does, how would your decision change? I, I, don't, I mean, it's, it's up to the parent. This how would your decision parents. change, though? As I'm just trying to understand. So we've had they eight obviously people, think it's important. Eight they people have said it's important out of 3,600 3, parents. For that. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of data that we have. It's transparent to provide that data. That would be my position on it. I just don't think there's any harm in doing it. What's the I downside? Don't know. Right. I mean, there's there's really no downside. We have the data. The um, and then as with any as with any data, people can do with what they feel is necessary to do with that data. Um, and right. Some people some people see the data and say, "I don't need mm -hmm. to wear a mask." Uh, some people see the data and say, "I need to wear a mask or get a vaccine more. or not get a vaccine." Okay, so it's all problem. it's all about. Um, people's level of risk this is something that that i think we've kind of lost as a as a society is what's our level of risk we have to evaluate that as a person by person family by family type of thing and if another piece of data helps somebody figure out what their risk level is then let's give it to them so you're right people could see that, that we were at 15 percent or whatever just throwing out <coughs> and then decide to sign a mask exemption because they feel like the risk is low then. they it's could do that right Sure. I mean, I, I, I think I just, I like dat data that is concrete as much as possible. And that isn't, we know positive. If you either have a positive or either positive or you're not, that's why I don't like even presumed positives. That's not an actual test. It's just a, you might have COVID just by your symptoms. I'm glad we're separating them out. I commend our district for doing that, but um, mask exemptions are not definitive data. It's well, just no, you either have one or you don't have right. one. That's, that's very agree? definitive. But, I mean, whether they wear it or not, that's you're right, not definitive. But whether right. they whether they have an exemption or not is definitive. True. But we would never know. You never know. So nope. and I, I would like to also respond to we're not ignoring 80%. I do not think that 80% of the people are not wearing a mask. We had a speaker that said 
that we're ignoring 80% for the 20%. That's not true. A lot of people aren't signing Let's masks. Let's keep the conversation to the dashboard. Yeah. That's what this, well, this it's about discussion item, mm -hmm. item is about. That's gotcha. it's, it's about, about the dashboard information, so. Right, and we're not ignoring the 80%, so. So Brent, Sharon, Mills, I think. I mean, I could Let's really see. go either way on it. I, I'm not um, saying that we should withhold information, but I think we probably have exemptions to other immunizations and things like True. that. Then do we put that those things out there to the public? True. I don't think you want to do that. So, you know, sometimes the decisions we make kind of set precedents for the things too. So that would probably be my only concern. But I think if we have the information and it's available, there really isn't any reason to withhold it from people. Right. So, so we, so we will start putting who's exempt from vaccinations and things as well. No, no, no this is very specific. This is a dis to... this is a discussion item, first of all. Well, so before I'm going to do anything, you're going to have to vote on. Right, yeah. So that means I'll bring it back in two weeks for a vote. If there's if there's a determination that you want to vote, so before we start saying we're just doing this, that's why it was brought as a discussion item. And it's very specific about, about the single discussion item, the single um, decision of, on the board specific to the, the modification of the parenting exemptions <coughs> for wearing masks. It's very specific to that. By percentage by school building. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. I, I could go either way on it and it's transparency. Yeah. It's, I see we Dr. Back Burke, are you seeing like a lot of these coming in and out and people withdrawing them and submitting new ones all the time or is it Katie's cat uh, Katie Claire is kind of the expert because she's the holder of all the information I don't know that we've seen much of it I haven't anyway. seen a single withdrawal I mean I I think in that case the parent probably wouldn't let us know though that they're withdrawing the form they would just say hey Bobby you need to wear a mask every day in case they're going up in your building or whatever but do you see more coming in every week um, there are a few more staggering than, of course, that first week yeah, was fine. the influx. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say the last two or three weeks, we've gotten maybe six to eight additional a week. All the schools? Yes. Schools. Yep. Well, not high school. Not high school, correct. Right. But all the elementary schools. No. I don't have a problem if it, if it thinks that we're not being transparent. I don't want to be thought of as not being transparent. I don't know that it is super relevant, but I don't want to not be transparent either. So, we can just bring it back for a vote next next time. If that's the will of the board, do we do we need a vote or? <laughs> No. Can we do it? No, no, you'll, you'll need to vote. Though. Okay. If that's what you're comfortable with. I thought you meant we'll do we that. need to vote right now. No, it's no it wouldn't be tonight. But, but we'll bring it back as a vote. Okay. We'll bring it back. Yeah, we'll bring discussion. it back as an action item. Good discussion. Moving <coughs> uh, on to discussion item 10.05, critical race theory update, Dr. Burke. Yeah, I know, uh, I know that a couple board members asked us to, we started out with a informal discussion and a couple board members asked us to go ahead and have a formal discussion presentation. So Brad Wilson and it uh, looks like Aaron Smith have done a lot of work and they're gonna share this information with you. Thank you. I think some of the things that yeah. Okay. Some of the things that you guys have asked for is to a uh, little bit of background on critical race theory. So uh, we've done some research on that. Um, asked for board policies that we have pertaining to this um, and whether we are teaching CRT. So we brought um, really a comprehensive uh, answers to those questions. So one of the things I'm not going to do today is read you the slides. There's a lot of information here. I know you guys can read. I wanted the information to be available so you could see it and still have it later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the highlights and then the details are in the presentation. 
so that you have those for good. Um, I will tell you, I was a little bit surprised as I started researching this. I first want to qualify this by, I am no expert on critical race theory, um, and I probably never will be. Um, but as I researched this, and I tried to find the most credible sources I could, and I started really with the um, um, American Bar Association. But when I went there, it kind of backed it up and talked about where it really got its start. And so the first two slides here are really a backup to where did critical race theory come from? Well, it started originally with just called what's called critical theory. And it's really just talking about that our social problems stem from the structures and cultural assumptions more than from individuals. And so that then, you can see that's quite a, quite a long time ago, that then led to critical legal studies. So then talking about, and if to, I were to be brief, really talking about the folks that make the laws are the ones that have benefit from the laws. And then those who don't make the laws potentially can be disadvantaged from them. Um, and so that could be subgroups such as uh, gender subgroups or race subgroups that we'll talk about as well. And at the bottom of each slide, I did put the sources that I got the information from. So this is actually all straight from the American Bar Association. They actually put this on their website, they say, because of they have um, civil rights attorneys um, that need to access this information. Um, and so really critical race theory is about um, attorneys really looking at um, civil rights and really being able to look at it from a more global or systematic. Um, and we talk about institutionalized racism um, but really talking about it in terms of a system-wide issue. And so does the laws of the land um, really make uh, Black Americans um, really second-class citizens by the law that's written? Um, it does specifically say on the website for American Bar Association that CRT is not a diversity and inclusion training, um, but it's really a, a law we look at race and racism. So a couple of tenants, and I actually had four of them, but I just grabbed two of them because really a lot of them are, and you'll even find these two are fairly similar, but really and all is that um, it, it's about being systematic and not so much about the individual. Um, and I think when we talk about racism, lots of time, we talk about individual acts. CRT considers really racism um, being a part of cooked into the system. Um, starting for some as early as the uh, Constitution. As you know, um, slavery was uh, pretty prevalent at that time. And so being cooked into whether it's laws or even the foundations of our country. And I did want to give the, actually this is the exact same example that they gave on the uh, American Bar Association website. And it just shows a little bit how racism can be actually um, embedded into the laws. So most of us know Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was what said um, that you could have separate but equal for whites and blacks, and that as long as they had separate uh, comparable facilities, that you could have segregation between black facilities that could be used by black people and facilities that could be used by white people. So that was Plessy versus Ferguson that said that was okay to do. Brown versus Topeka Board of Education is the one that said inherently separate is not equal. Um, and so most of us are very aware of that um, uh, case. So what it said then is that we had to figure out ways to desegregate our school. Um, and so uh, this example is Detroit schools. And before Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, um, Detroit schools were in 1940 about 9.2%. Um, black uh, was their makeup. And so obviously, as we went into uh, integration or desegregation, um, the idea of that 9.2 all being in one location, um, Brown versus Topeka Board, that wasn't the way it should be. So then um, after 
Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. In 67, you can see now the ratio is such that the actual majority, 58%, and those don't add up to 100 because obviously there are other uh, besides just black and white in those schools, but it was 58 to 41 um, blacks to whites. And so actually uh, black students were the majority in there. Well, as you can imagine, that makes uh, desegregation and integration of schools a little bit challenging. So really what the argument that uh, Detroit made was that we need to include suburbs in the desegregation efforts. And so they wanted to bus students from suburban school districts into the Detroit school district. Um, and what Milliken versus Bradley said was that, no, we, we're not including um, other suburban school districts. Your job is to desegregate Detroit schools. We don't need to include other school districts into that. Makes a lot of sense on the surface, but what they would say is that in 2000, when you have 91% of the student body is black, then essentially Milliken makes that idea of segregation essentially impossible. And so um, that's really just, and Thurgood Marshall, most of you guys know who that is, that he's one that um, opposed the Milliken decision. Um, and he's the only one. But that's the kind of the idea of critical race theory in the law there are, can be considered laws that actually have the effect of um, being unequal treatment of whites and blacks. So I think probably when, because for the most part, that probably isn't what you heard on the news. Um, and so it wasn't what I've heard on the news about um, critical race theory. <laughs> but, and even uh, American Bar says that really it's been evolving, people take it in all sorts of ways. So one of the things that is out there is what's called the 1619 Project. And again, I don't, I'm not really well versed in it. I actually found that Greg Oheen knows much more about it than I do. But what it tries to do, and I put the quote in here that's actually from the New York Times. Well, the New York Times sponsors it. Um, and so obviously um, that gives you their reference on it. But as far as I understand, what it tries to do is uh, make hypotheticals that really put it in perspective, a whole different perspective. Um, if something else would have happened, how might America be different? And so it takes things almost to extremes and comes up then with conclusions that might not be what really happened in history, but what they would assume happened under other situations. Now, again, I am not going to pretend to have any real knowledge of the 1619 Project. I'm getting most of that from other sources uh, on that idea. That's what I think when I've heard of 1619 Project and people objecting to the 1619 Project, it's the idea that they're taking these hypotheticals um, to what people would say absurd um, lengths and drawing them conclusions that they don't like from it. And again, do you have anything to add on that part? Because Dr. Smith probably knows every bit as much, if not more, than I do on probably all of this. But I am going to let her talk about one of the questions we were asked is, are we teaching um, CRT? And so what we wanted, to, when, we, when we asked that question and looked into it, the answer to the simple answer is no. But we are teaching about race. We are teaching about institutionalized racism. And that's what I wanted to um, Dr. Smith to talk about a little bit. Good evening. So like Mr. Wilson shared, um, critical race theory, it's not a part of the Kansas State Board of Education's approved curriculum. So as a local school district that aligns to the State Board of Education, it's not a part of the Spring Hill School District curriculum either. Uh, we had some conversations with our building principals and our teachers. There is no classroom teacher that's currently teaching critical race theory, and no one is using the 1619 project as a curricular resource. Um, as Mr. Wilson alluded to, we do have the topic of racism or institutionalized racism within the curriculum. So if you think particularly in a historical context for topics such as the Civil War and slavery, uh, topics such as the Civil Rights Movement, the Holocaust, those are instances where in our curriculum, you'll see racism as a theme that's examined. So it's primarily in there as a historical context. Um, because those can be sensitive subjects, 
These are addressed by our controversial issues policy. There is a board policy regarding controversial issues where our teachers can present this sensitive material in a fair and balanced manner. So that is a policy that addresses that. Uh, just a few more examples from middle school and high school. You'll see we have like novels such as To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Mockingbird, which would have, of course, racism as a theme within that novel, but again, in a historical context. Um, our teachers are able to bring in current event articles though. So you may find a teacher who identifies a current event article that is relevant to a historical topic that they are discussing in their classroom. Uh, but all of these things, I think you would expect <laughs> to find within a history classroom uh, at any school district um, and certainly any school in, in the Spring Hill district. Um, one thing I wanted to mention too, just because this was a question I think the board had had, was also just about curricular materials and selection and policies related to that. We do have policies regarding our instructional program. Uh, policy IF relates to textbooks and instructional materials. And so it articulates a process, one which I think the board is probably most familiar with, with our recent math textbook adoption process. So involving teacher input, reviewing a number of resources, and then bringing that before the Board of Education. So those materials are vetted um, by both teachers, myself as part of the uh, teaching and learning team and then shared with the board for final approval. And there is a process within this uh, textbook and instructional materials policy for any challenges that might come up as well. So there are currently policies in place that address how we select materials and then what we would do if we had any concerns about those. So Dr. Smith brings up an important uh, policy um, because we do vet all of our resources. Other policies that we found that were pertinent, obviously our controversial issues policy, and this I will read, it's uh, fairly short. It says when a controversial subject arises in the classroom, teachers may use the opportunity to teach about the controversy. Teachers shall ensure that various positions concerning any controversial subject are presented and that students have the opportunity to freely discuss the topic. Probably the point I want to bring up to this is when a controversial subject arises. So typically that happens because students have questions and they ask about things that they're seeing either on the news or in their lives or or what have you. And we talked about um, current events sometimes being that situation. Um, and so what I, th I think we have to be real careful of is if we're going to say this topic is off limits. I think we have to put ourselves in the position of, let's just say, in this case, um, a minority, an African-American student who says, you know, I have a question about this thing that I saw in, in the news, uh, whether it's critical race theory or Black Lives Matter or what have you, and they ask a teacher about it, that when the teacher says, well, you know, I can talk about a lot of things, but I can't talk about these types of issues. If you think about the position that that puts that student in is, okay, but you can talk about white issues, but you can't talk about the issues that pertain to me uh, about African-Americans in America. I think we have to be real careful if we were to say, teachers, you can't touch X subject um, because we do have students in our schools and looking at our GBU ethics, I only put part of it in here, but quite frankly, I really think that first bullet, recognize the basic dignity of all individuals, is as important one as we can deal with. Um, we want our students to feel safe. We have Title IX is a uh, requirement that we can't have on the basis of gender, students feeling uncomfortable and put in situations that might deny them education. And the same is true. We have other laws as well um, for racism and those types of things. But I really think, and I love that this is in the ethics part is, I just think that's part of being a public um, educational institution is we have to understand that we're gonna have all different types of students in our schools. And we wanna make sure that we are respecting the dignity of all individuals. In that same one, it says, um, extend to students the opportunity for individual action in the pursuit of learning and shall take steps to ensure that the students shall have access to varying points of view. So what that means is opportunity for individual action is that they can actually seek out knowledge within our schools. Um, that might be actually outside of our curricular objectives that they actually have some freedom to explore um, learning. 
And then the last one is IF, which is the instructional materials. Um, like Dr. Smith talked about, it has a process in there, but I did want to point out one little area in there, and that says information which helps students um, develop an appreciation of American cultural, ethnic, and racial diversity, and balanced views concerning international, national, state, and local issues and problems um, is part of our board policy um, that we're supposed to consider when adopting the materials. So those are really the three board policies that, that we found that really pertain to um, what we teach in the classroom. I did want to take time, and I, it's a little bit off because this is talking about women's rights. Um, but obviously, and again, um, race issues can be very charged. Um, and so they are sensitive and they are what we would consider a, a controversial topic. Um, but I don't think it's far off of where we've gone in our society where uh, we've had some of the same issues with women's rights um, as well. And so when we think about that, um, it, it's a little surprising. So we had obviously women's suffrage movement started. And in fact, they have a, in New York, they have a really a set point that that started. And then obviously, you know, the 19th Amendment is when uh, females were given the right to vote. And yet that didn't necessarily change that there's sexism in our world and even cooked into it. Um, I gave you some states that actually took quite a bit of time to ratify the 19th Amendment. Um, the latest one was uh, in 1984, Mississippi. Um, I know, seems kind of surprising. But in discussing that, a teacher might say things like, so do women today get equal pay for equal work? Personally, most times I know they get less pay for more work. Um, and there is a glass ceiling and there is institutional sexism. Um, and so we don't want any male student to feel bad about themselves. That's not the idea. But quite frankly, it's on, it can't be just on females to fix the problem. And again, it goes back to that idea is we have to all work towards a solution to these social issues. And so, um, you know, when it comes to it, we all have a responsibility for improving the situation. And so the same is true about racism and institutionalized wow. racism. You've seen that where it's addressed in our curriculum. And we're gonna talk about how it's not just the African-American community that has to deal with it. It's all of our responsibilities. And in schools, it's all of our responsibility to make all of our students feel welcome, have dignity, be respected. And I think we all want that. I don't think that's in any question. Um, our schools, I say not knowingly, because we would never knowingly tolerate. Um, I think some of you saw in the yearbook, um, and again, I don't really like the word that was used in full because in our society, um, the N word really is never said and for good reason, it is a racial slur. Um, but we have kids walking around in our schools that are saying that they hear that on a fairly regular basis. That's disturbing to us. Um, and so it is, it is all of our students' responsibility um, to make sure that that kind of, and I would call it hate speech is not in our schools. And so um, that, that article was disturbing to me for that reason um, as well. Things that CRT is not, and I think we've kind of hit this, is it's not diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's different. CRT is not gender identity, gay rights, or any other non-race issue. It's specifically about race. We do have students of... Um, races, ethnicities, gender identities, sexual preferences, and other characteristics that make them who they are. Um, and no student want, should be made feel less than in our schools um, because they're different. And that's, that's really as a public school institution, um, that has to be our stance because that's what we are. We're about educating all kids. So thoughts, questions on CRT. So I see that CRT is not diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I have seen materials that would argue that 
diversity, equity, and inclusion training includes a lot of CRT in it, as well as gender identity issues in it. So I, 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 I think it, to me it's, and I've heard somebody say it's CRT light, which there are some programs out there, and I don't know if we use any of these <laughs> programs, but. In Do you have an example that we would, that would be like a CRT type of thing happening in a diversity, no, diversity equity, equity inclusion? inclusion training? Yeah, I'm, as I'm just saying, do you have examples of that that we could look into? I just didn't find that. It's it's something that uh, some surrounding school has the training materials. Speak to that a little okay, bit. go ahead. Um, I've actually participated in two years of diversity, equity, and inclusion training in a previous school district. Um, at no point did we discuss critical race theory. The goal of those trainings were to learn more about our students and how we could continue to build relationships and connect with them and make them feel safe and secure in our schools. Um, and I felt like that was really beneficial for me as an educator, just to learn how I could be more inclusive to our students and make them feel like school is a place that they would want to be. But they both programs talk about inherent racism and white people are born racists. And the program that I participated in did not address um, people being inherently racist, but rather um, making sure that we recognize and celebrate the differences among all of our children and among all of our staff and employees and to celebrate the differences and how that diversity is a strength for us as a community. Fantastic must be different than what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Nels, I would say there are people that have that viewpoint. Um, but even in my investigation of truly what CRT is as a legal basis, it actually does almost the opposite. It takes a slant that it's not about the individual person as being racist as the issue, is that it's the structure of society is the issue. And so it's almost exactly the opposite, even though, either one could be taken to extreme levels, but I've heard people talk like what you're talking about, um, but the people who are saying that and maybe calling it CRT, probably they don't even understand what CRT is when they say, I'm doing this and it's CRT. My guess is they don't even know that it's not CRT. So I guess so. when I brought this up, it wasn't to argue necessarily CRT. We are not talking about inherent racism in our school, I guess, is where I was trying to go with that. And CRT was the, the avenue that I used to communicate. Yeah. And so what I would say is we don't want anybody to feel like they're less than. So we don't want anybody to feel like they're less than because they're born white skinned any more than we would um, want somebody to feel less than because they were born with black skin or male, female, you name it. Yeah. So... I mean, yeah, I, we, we totally support that idea. And Martin Luther King, the students were taught the op, you know, this, these new programs are almost the opposite of what Martin Luther King was talking about, that uh, you're, you're judged on your character, not the color of your skin. And we're almost going backwards with some of these programs. We're going back to saying it's, it's your color, your skin, and not your character. And that's just the wrong message to me. I think it is confusing. I think that the, the news has confused things a lot too. People just kind of have buzzwords and they're confused. And what I understood the conversation to be when Nels brought it up was um, identifying what exactly we are doing. And we know that CRT isn't an approved state board curriculum. I think that that's pretty, I think it's pretty widely known. But as I looked through um, just at Aubrey Bend, just down the street, Blue Valley's DEI training, there is a lot of that. I think that's where the confusion comes from. I mean, I've got it in front of me and page one says white privilege be benefits white people at the expense of people of color, white people oppress people of color. So that's there's that's sixth grade, then it's just like what a, a mile from our from Timber Sage or so right so it's it's pretty close. So I think that's where some of the confusion is between they're using the word CRT, but this is a DEI training. And so I, I think that that is where it's coming from. So a couple of follow-up questions. Um, you talked about how racism is identified in our schools. I, I, I can't speak for everybody up here, but I think exactly what you said, people would agree with you. We don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable ever in our schools in any way, shape or form. But 
um, so that the policy IKB, I think I wrote it down right, um, which is teaching about controversial issues, is that with opinions, I think that is what the parents are concerned about, is that there are things being imparted on their children that they might not believe in, and they feel like that is an overstep. So if it is an article that's a hard topic or whatever, is that just presented as an article or is that is there any accountability in the opinion of it presented as well? So our um, policy says we need to be presenting it in a balanced way. Um, there are some parents, and I've heard from, that don't want it presented at all. And if it's presented at all, then they feel like they don't want that. But that's having opinions on both sides of an issue is balanced. Um, there are some issues you can't pull opinions completely out of it. Like there isn't just like you even heard me in this one. We want all of our kids to feel comfortable, safe. you know, that's my opinion. Um, and so to some of these, if it's a controversial issue, there are going to be opinions given. But our teachers, what it's incumbent on them is that people hear both sides of the issue. So both the sides of the issue would be presented, not just a political opinion or a, how somebody individually feels yeah. about it. In fact, it. I have a good friend of mine that um, his goal is by the end of the year, the students are um, thoroughly confused about where he actually stands politically well, so um, because he should at times be able to argue either side. Um, and what he tries to do is if he's hearing a predominant argument in the classroom, like the students tend to be on one side, then he'll argue the other side um, so that they get a balanced view of it. Um, and so his goal is by the end of the school year that they have no idea where he stands because at times he's um, given opinions on one side of the issue and at other times he's given um, what would, people would be considering opposite opinions. Um, but what he's trying to do is make sure that at any subject that comes out, it's going to be a balanced presentation. And that's what we would want our teachers to do. Um, I would say, you know, I taught physics and not a whole lot of controversy. Um, you may or may not like um, quantum. You may be uh, the Copenhagen interpretation, but to be quite honest, nobody gets really too riled about that. So I have, uh, I, I don't envy you know, my social studies teachers and those types of things, because, and even English teachers, you saw, we, we talk about books, because obviously, they're, that's a hard thing to do, because, um, like I said, our, my friend always tries to figure out where the room is, and balance on the opposite side where the room is, um, but if you've got a room that's one side all the time, you may look like you're the other side, in that one and you're giving an opinion like that. And so I do believe it's hard for them. And I don't know that I have a perfect answer yeah. for how to do that, but that's what we want our teachers to do. So I think that alone is first of all, what parents want to hear. I mean, I totally agree that nobody should walk out of any classroom knowing politically where any teacher aligns because they're trying to teach them to critically think, right? So that's why they're presenting both sides to that. Um, and also you make another good point. Physics shouldn't probably wouldn't have the opportunity to be talking <laughs> no. about, and it shouldn't be. So those should be isolated to the classrooms that are appropriate for that. Yeah. I think that's very good for parents to hear too, that science, a science teacher might not be talking about. George. A biology teacher might, you know, when you, especially when cloning was first starting, that, that was a pretty controversial sure. thing for them to talk about. And yet it was actually uh, part of their curriculum. To right. be able to discuss so like that racism or something, no, like but not, that yeah. kind of thing is not happening. No. Should be having a science. No, that classroom. should be probably social studies, maybe in English classes, especially as they study things like poetry and and come across those issues too. Sure. So you, um, we talked about where racism is addressed. If, it, if they're just using that as an example, a parent could at any time ask for the materials that the children are looking at. Students, I oh, should yeah. say, students. They're older usually when we're talking about. Yep, I'm, yeah. I'm going to defer, but there actually is a process that they can um, either, we call it a complaint actually about the curriculum, but they, they can review the materials um, in that process. Okay, so I'm, I'm wondering, and, and Nels, please correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe I'm off base for where, what you're asking with this, but I, I think that the concern, it, like we said, it's like these buzzwords, it isn't necessarily CRT, it is, and what we're hearing from parents is, is probably more DEI. 
Like what, what are we doing for DEI in the district? Are we, do we have mandatory training like this Blue Valley training does? What, what does it look like? We do not, but we need to have diversity, equity, and inclusion training just to make sure that our kids, just what Dr. Smith talked about, not to say that we're one side or the other, but to understand where our kids are coming. So um, kids that come out of uh, deep poverty have different issues. Sometimes we call them ACEs, have different issues that they're having to deal with. And it's important um, that our teachers understand that kind of trauma. And we call it trauma-informed care. They understand that trauma. Hospitals do that same kind of actually trauma-informed care as well to understand what the patient, or in this case, the student is bringing to the table. Same thing, if you're a student that um, is a minority, there are some issues that you bring to the table and we need to be understanding of those because our goal long story is the education of every one of our kids. And if you turn off a, a student because they're different than the majority of the class, I can tell you right now, that student is not gonna learn to their maximum potential. You've added to their stress and trauma instead of relieving that stress and trauma to give them the best environment for them to learn. And again, like you said, that's a tough balance sometimes because what makes some kids uncomfortable doesn't make others and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But our goal is the best education possible for our kids. So we do have plans to potentially implement this kind of training, DEI, and I'm not opposed yeah. to that. I would like to request that we could see it before it's implemented. Sure. I mean, uh, I'll be honest, what I am seeing in this booklet that was presented to sixth grade, sixth grade teachers to talk about that includes divisiveness and as white, I mean, it even quoted in there uh, for white educators in America, race is a privilege. And I'm not saying that that's not right, but I feel like we, there, that's a slippery slope sometimes too. And that's when parents are getting, that's what they're hearing about and that's what they're upset about. Um, and then even just, it talks in there about um, sexual preferences and, and we're talking to sixth grade teachers in this and, and pronouns. And these are the things that the parents are concerned about. Um, and I do think recognize, I had an interesting conversation today about recognizing bias. So that's in there too. I think we all have inter innate bias and you just, yes. if you recognize it, then you can maybe easier, it's easier to deal with yep. it. But those are the things that I think that, I think there's a lot, I also, feel like it's a lot of pressure on teachers. I don't want to put any more pressure on our teachers. We need, to, the parents need to parent <laughs> and the teachers need to educate, right? Yeah. So this feels a little like it's blurring the lines to me as I read through this. So I don't know when we're considering bringing that training about, but maybe that. Well, I can't one. speak to that, but our training will be for the sole purpose to improve our education. Um, and to do that, we need kids to, we need teachers to understand kids, to understand what they bring to the table. Uh, whether it's their uh, sexual preference, which some kids are demonstrating that fairly early. We need to understand where kids are coming from with that so we can best educate them. So I agree and don't agree. I think that sexual preference is something they talk about with their parents. I don't think it has any place in a sixth grade classroom or even in a high school classroom, not something they can talk about at home. We're, pa we're starting to parent parent the children then if we're educating them too. Not that we don't want to understand them, but sexual preference is very confusing, especially to uh, their brains aren't even fully developed until they're 25. It's very, very confusing. So I think that we've got that to be very careful with that too. And, and here's my call to pushback or what have you is, but it's in our schools. And so just like kids who have, um, we have, we have minors having sex. Mm -hmm. And so in health class, we talk about ways that they can protect themselves mm -hmm. and that's parenting, yeah. but it's also in the state curriculum as well. And so the lines are blurred. Yeah. And so what we need to do is whatever is best for our kids to help them. Um, we do believe, in fact, it's part of our strategic plan. We strongly believe that parents need to be doing their part on this, mm -hmm. but when kids come and they aren't doing their part, then sometimes they put the onus on that teacher when they start asking questions and the teacher is put in an awkward position. And so what we have to be careful of and what this training can help us do is you can either say, oh, well, no, you're, you're, I can't talk about people like you. Or you can say, you know, have you asked your mom about this? Have you asked, you know, there are different ways to handle it. And that's what some of this uh, training should help us do. 
So, and I agree with that completely. If we're putting it, if the teachers are putting it back to, have you talked to your parents about this? Yeah. That's a, a sometimes they can't. And that's, that's understandable. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example and it's, it's not a perfect example because I will be uh, the first to admit that um, I probably didn't as a teacher always do the best job of understanding and accepting every student. But I had the student and I have a, I have a, a picture frame that she gave me at the end. And it says on the picture frame, you change the way I see the world. And she was a, a physics student of mine. She did not want to take physics. What I didn't understand is that um, she was also had, um, she was gay. And so she changed and that's why I keep that thing. And I, it's one of the few things that a kid's given me that I keep in my office showing at all time. Because what Megan did was she changed the way I see the world and helped me become more accepting of all kids. Because quite frankly, her parents didn't accept that about her. And it was real easy for me to do the same thing, but it changed the way she learned physics when I didn't hold something against her. And I hope that no child feels like that, that their teacher is not teaching them the same as other children in any way. I mean, I would like to say they're not, that that's not happening, but maybe I guess you're saying it could, that teachers could have bias. But when a student them. brings something to you, and you completely just say, no, I, I can't talk about those things. And that, that changes the way they react to you in I, class. I don't think it would be a no, I'm not talking to you. It's, have you talked with your parents yet? Have you talked with the counselor yet? No. Have you talked? It's that kind of thing. That's the assurances the parents want, that it's not going to be just, we're going to be stepping in and parenting for them. Oh, we, we do do parenting in our schools. If you want to be honest, that's part of what it is to be a teacher is to help kids grow emotionally it's i mean that's what i mean think about it. we have a social emotional curriculum mm -hmm. we're helping kids grow emotionally and socially we don't want to step on parents toes and, and that's exact i think that's what they're saying that's what they feel like their toes have been stepped on and they're afraid they don't know so but i think as Allie, long as what's impossible out, is for us never to step on anybody's toes i think as long as the training is made public sure to what the teacher's training is that that they will then we're more than happy to and do that. And that the public is then able to look at it, understand it, ask questions, because maybe that's some of what it is. They just don't, they wouldn't understand. Yeah. So I just what I can't be. promise you is that no teacher is going to step on a parent's toes. I, I can't promise that. I mean, I, I can give you an example of something that happened not too long ago, too. When I say not too long, a few years ago, but I had a, a person, a, a student, asked me who they thought, who I thought was going to win an election. And I said, oh, I think so-and-so is going to win. And the student got upset and went home and the parent got upset. And, and they said, well, we can't believe you're supporting that person. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute. You asked me who I thought would win the race. That's much different than asking me who I support because I wouldn't have told you who I supported. But I think that is happening too for somebody because because if somebody comes up and asks a teacher what white privilege is, and a teacher starts saying, this is what white privilege is, that's not saying that that teacher is advocating for white privilege. I don't know this curriculum or whatever you're, you're talking about. We don't have that. But, but, but if somebody comes up and asks a teacher what white privilege is, and the teacher starts explaining what white privilege is, that doesn't mean that they support that or that sure. they advocate for it. Sometimes they're just asking a question. And a lot of times people get wound up because they don't like the answer. Well, a lot of times teachers get into the point where they build these relationships with kids. And sometimes there are some situations where parents aren't parenting. I mean, trust me, we deal with abuse a lot more than I'd ever like to. And so when he says that we're having to parent is we have kids that come to us for a lot of things that parents used to always I mean, think about it. We provide breakfast. Many school districts in the United States are starting to provide um, dinner. Uh, people are providing <laughs> food over the weekends. So to say that we're not doing some parenting is to not be really aware of what's going on in the world. And so, um, you know, it, sh should we be sh sharing things balanced? Absolutely, we should. But sometimes something can be asked a certain way you can answer that question and then all of a sudden 
just as in my experience, somebody asked me who I thought would win an election. And I told them, that doesn't mean I liked that person or even wanted that person to win. But I thought that they would win. And they, believe it or not, ended up winning. So again, I think sometimes we have this whole idea that schools can't do all these things. There's a lot of things that we're being asked to do and we've been asked to do for quite a few times. So few years. another example of this is the Jason Flat Act requires us to, on a student that we suspect, suspect could be, um, have some tendencies um, for suicide, to do an assessment. We've literally been raked over the coals for doing that. How dare you give this assessment to my student? And, and I understand that. They, they're very sensitive about that. They're, they're frustrated. They're feeling, um, cannot believe that, that their student is having these feelings. Um, and, and so that's why I say I can't guarantee you we're not going to step on toes. Because even when we follow the law, which is the Jason Flat Act, we're going to step on some toes. It's not the majority, but there's not much we can do that's not going to step on somebody's toes. What I want to be very sure we're not doing is making the parents feel like we're dismissing this concern because it's a big concern yeah. for a lot of people. And they're, it, they're hard topics. So they, it's hard to bring it up. They don't know how to call somebody and bring it up. They don't know what to say. So this is something we hear about a lot. And I just don't want it to seem like we're dismissing them at all. Because and, and part of the reason it came up was because the National Teacher Association said they were going to start pushing it regardless of what the curriculum was allowed or what parents wanted. So it was clearly brought up in their convention that they would start pushing and put money behind them. So that, that's also part of the concern. Yeah, and I understand that. Our that. association hasn't what brought any suggestion of, of doing things. So that's great. And this would be we driven like through our administration. I think the final part of your question, Miles, was about policy, right? Policy review and yeah. do we have things that apply? And Looks you mentioned, like we've got it. You mentioned three policies that seem to cover it. And then you were going to, I think you were going to mention a process. Allie brought up seeing uh, if they could see information, you know, uh, educational information. And you said there was a process that, right, oh. that parents had to work through to, to get oh. that information. That's correct. So if you had uh, any questions or concerns, you would actually start at the building level, a conversation with the building principal. If it was unable to be resolved at the wait, wait. building level. Let's start with the teacher first. Right. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. The policy just happens to state the building <laughs> principle, um, which is the in the textbook material selection policy. Um, so, yes, we would always encourage any parent that has a concern, they reach out to their teacher. But then the policy articulates that there would be a contact to the building principal. And if it was something that they could not resolve at the building level, they would submit a formal uh, complaint to the superintendent. The superintendent would share that with the Board of Education and you as a board would determine whether or not we would assemble a committee to review the, the item or the textbook material that was in question. And the committee, if assembled, would review that and then make a determination as to whether it remained a part of the curriculum. And that is outlined already in the board policy. That's different than just an individual parent wanting to know what's being taught in government. Or Which, what, yeah, right? Any yeah. parent could ask yeah. this. Okay. Additionally, if you remember the about 13 page KN complaint policy, uh, the very end of that. Um, so a lot of that's on discrimination, um, harassment, those types of things. But at the very end, it talks about complaints of curriculum, complaints of, of things like that. So there is specifically outlined that um, you can file a formal complaint for curriculum as well. Uh, and like Dr. Smith said, we take every parent complaint seriously. We really do. You guys have any more questions for Mr. Wilson or Ms. Smith? I appreciate putting that. Yeah, yeah great. Thank both you. Of you. Great information, providing the clarity. I think it is. Thank you. The clarity of understanding the difference between what you hear in the news, what critical race theory really is, what the 1619 project is. What was the third piece? There was a third uh, diversity, oh, uh, equity. diversity, equity, and inclusion training, yep. and then, and I, you know, I don't think we would want to hold ourselves to a standard or a chastise or or, or uh, uh, our current administration teachers and staff for a pro program that we don't even have. Um, it's I think it's important that we have these good discussions so that it's clear as to how people are thinking, certainly on the board and administration, we all understand each other. 
and yeah, can and I, provide I, that. Actually, it's really important to be able to provide that that clarity of understanding um, to parents because I think that that's really important to. to yeah, because actually, when I started this, I was in a whole different state of thinking. Um, right where Nels was is I didn't really understand that CRT was not what you were talking about. I really didn't. I had no idea on that. Um, and so it was a complete surprise to me. So I knew where your concern was and, and I don't want to devalue it by saying it wasn't CRT. Right. Um, but I was actually surprised to find out the CRT was something a little different. Yeah. Thank you. And Doug, I agree with you. I, that is exactly because when a parent comes to one of us and says, what is being, what's the right. policy, what's the board policy? It's important that we understand too, so we can have an intelligent conversation about it and really make help them to understand. Oh, it's that clarity. That's the piece that I think, I mean, you mentioned how different things you see in social media and on, uh, on news, they muddy the waters between the things. And we can, I think this is a good step to provide the clarity that parents need. So thank you, Brian and uh, Dr. Smith. Where'd she go? Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Well done. Are you all right if I let them go? Yeah, sure. Um, all right, moving on to uh, informal discussion presentation. This is alternative to board docs, Mr. Wimble. Yeah, um, so one of the things that uh, is a new offering from Kansas Association of School Boards is something that I've actually been using with KSB and it's called board book. Um, I just, the uh, board book is, has been developed by the uh, Texas State School Boards Association to help give school boards a, a, another option and for they're saying a better option, but uh, KSB has decided to drop board docs as their go-to board uh, application and adopted board book. Um, I personally used it. I think, I believe it's better than um, board docs in a few ways, but I, I wanted to bring this up because I want us to, um, or I would like for staff, uh, Katie, Candy, and Phil to get a demo of board book, make some comparisons to board docs so that, uh, and then bring those results back to us to see if they would like to move to it. Um, it, it has some effect to us, but not a lot. I mean, it's still gonna be a meeting agenda. It's still gonna have attachments and um, it's just a different place to go. But if it'll make their life easier um, then, uh, and their work easier, and I, I hope that's the case. The other aspect of it, and it's attached in the agenda, um, uh, an annual cost, if we go with the um, tier two, which is the um, higher level tier, uh, uh, more things, more features in board book, it's $6,000 annually. Um, we are now paying $9,000 a year for board docs. So it would be a saving of at least $3,000. And that's through KASB. Um, there's also the, the, they have a fixed contract pricing if we wanna do that as well. So um, I would just ask staff to, at, at their leisure, get a demo, compare, and bring back the results. What I, I think, another, go ahead, go ahead Nelson. <laughs> I was just saying, what, what's it do? What's different about it or what's better? So some of it is, um, so like you can see the attachments within the application it doesn't open another window unless you wanted to. Um, it has, if you want to do electronic voting, we can do that. Um, there's some features in, in the, the attachment that, um, um, that you can look through. Another thing, and we already do this with board docs and it's tracking goals and planning strategic plans and things like that. But um, one of the things that I thought was nice is we can put our committee level notes in there. So if we have bond committee or um, we could even, it may get, be, get to be too big, but we could probably put our site council notes for those meetings in board book as well so that they can be preserved. Um, 
it's just there's a a, a few things that could um, could be beneficial. Um, one of the things I did like was um, follow the leader. So all you have to do is click follow the leader, and as as Phil changes to the next agenda item, your screen changes to the next agenda item. You don't have to keep clicking around to figure out where everybody is or whatever. Just a good feature, but. I just thought we'd at least, I mean, a, a different, something different is out there. It's a little bit cheaper. So let's see if our staff would like to use it. <coughs> Wasn't there another one that we, that I think it was like Atlanta or something was using or? There, was another there are quite a few, was. Uh, quite a few um, applications like this. It was just because this is directly from a school board association. I thought we'd look at that. I'd, I'd want to know what happens to everything we have in board docs because we have and that would be part of the discussion when, yeah whatever however many years we've been in board docs yeah. so that if they yeah and you know it has the same uh search search database um metadata database and they will from what i've talked to rod spangler who is at ksb they'll just move everything it's a, just a transfer of all the documents over so it has a it has a stronger search function so you can find things easier. Is that yeah? yeah. I can that is see one that. thing at yeah. board docs, you can't find anything. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can search and search. Yeah. I'd be interested in checking it out. Yeah. So I guess the direction is to have Katie and Candy look at and and Phil since it's Phil. technology. I mean, what we do on it's very simple with. You guys do down there is the yeah, hard part. That's that's why I would rather have your opinion. Well, I mean, yes. we have our opinion, but your guys' opinions of, of is it better? Is it worth you know worth moving to that sort of thing? And and how it would plug into our systems, I think is, <laughs> we don't want to create a nightmare for no. adding a piece of software. It's going to yep. So is that can you clear that? enough? Yeah, I don't I don't think the three thousand mm -hmm. dollars is a game changer, but. That's I mean, it's an item, but, but if there's yeah. productivity, better, then that's the three. If if three. Katie and Candy can do in six hours what used to take them ten, yeah, I mean that's, that's worth some. That's that's, worth that's a big there. thing, yeah. yeah. So making their lives easier. Um, Jason, I heard you say just do this at our own leisure as we have time. Can you give us kind of a time frame as to when you'd like to see this back? Um, Two uh, months. I would, probably have to defer to uh, Doug Schwinn on contract renewal or. It, it may be for July 1st of next year that we start this, but it depends on contract renewals and all that type of stuff as well. So the next report out that they could provide would be in how many meetings? I mean, if they could get something by January, I think it'd be good for oh, us. Oh, absolutely. Okay. That helps. Thank that you. Way, that way we can make a decision for the start of the next fiscal year. Yeah. Yep. We can certainly have your feedback by January. Good. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, moving on to items from Board of Education members for future meetings. Anything to add or subtract? Um, I wanted to, and I, I haven't built my thoughts around this yet, so it's going to take a, a few meetings. But one of the things that um, from the Kansas, uh, Kansas can success tour that came through very loudly to me is the um, the business community really needing non-academic skills. So we teach a tons of tons and tons of academic work, math, social studies, science, but we don't teach the human skills. I like to call them human skills. People call them soft skills, but they're just human skills like communication, writing, um, presentations, speeches, whatever. And um, they also had uh, a, a slide on what high school graduates are lacking at a business. And the number one what, number one thing was professionalism or worth it, work ethic. I'm not sure you can teach that in a, in a school, but I mean, it was very surprising to me. But I think the things that we can um, figure out how to teach our communication skills um, in collaboration, how to work with other people. So um, I, again, I want to put my, try to figure out what 
direction or what my thoughts are on it, but I want to put it on the list just to keep my me directed on how do we bring in human skills, teaching human skills, whether you know whatever that is, into our schools <coughs> um, to prepare our high school students for the workforce. That sounds like parenting. It does. It does. I, I, you call me a smart aleck, but we just no, got no. raked over the I coals know. for that. I know. And what you're talking about is parenting. I, I and I totally so, agree with that. I totally agree. So and what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, you're walking down that sticky slope that something that parents should be working with their kid. That we can do the communication. We have classes for them to take. Right. But I'm going to push back a little bit because I'm hearing that hey, you're doing too much with parenting. A lot of what you just talked about is parenting. I, I, I totally agree with that. And it's that's why I'm trying to still work my, still trying to figure out how we want to do this. But, um, but Jason, I, I would say, and, and we can show you some of the things that we are doing, but we certainly are um, with our, as we start to develop our real world learning and start to develop some of those really business connections and get kids doing some internships and things that, that really the whole purpose of that is to build a lot of those skills um, but the reality of it starting from elementary where they're doing um, seven habits right. for kids those seven habits are seven habits that are building into what you need to be successful in work um, they're not necessarily the strict math and reading we do that as well but that's that whole part of that um, strategic plan that's in the personal development. That per and you've you've seen in that we really recognize not just being um, college ready but life ready in that part of the strategic plan. And so those are the terminology we'll use. We even have indicators um, through uh, redefining ready, um, which is an AASA initiative um, that's going to integrate <laughs> with our real world learning. But those are indicators that are we're saying if you do this, then while you're in our schools and you can reach this level, then we would consider you to be college ready. That's the easy one. We've always done that one. But then having indicators to say we believe that you're career ready. And then indicators that say, we're going to believe that you're life ready. So one of those indicators is just attendance. And it seems like a really low standard. I think it's set at 80%. And that seems like a really low standard because you're gone one day a week and you're at 80%, right? So, but that is the level where research says if a kid is gone more than eight, you know, is, uh, gone more than 20%, then they have a statistically significant lower chance of being successful. And they have the data for college, but they also have it in their career. And so we consider that to be a, an indicator of whether you're going to be successful in your career. And so they're research-based. We're working on them. Um, it, Rod actually for the middle school has started thinking, how can I think in terms of pushing that down to middle school, what are the indicators who we would say that it's not so much that they're college or career ready or life ready at that point, but on track to be college, career, and life ready. And so it, this is part of our strategic plan. Um, you, it won't look all pretty and all fleshed out um, in the next couple of years, but that's really that where, you know, I talked about gifts and grants. That's that real world learning grant that we're working on is to do a lot of those things. So we'll get there. Yeah, I, I agree. I just, it, it really spoke to me in, and I had seen those numbers before, but, you know, in a room where we have a lot of parents and other board members, it was really, um, and especially an education presentation that a lot of the um, skills were more non-academic skills. So how do we do that as a public education institution? How do we, do we teach those? Because I know that we do. And quite frankly, you can probably remember for a long time, anytime we do a group project, it's collaboration. Your kids working together and those types of things. So um, the problem has never been teaching. The problem is measuring it. And right. how do you know if somebody, you can have a kid that takes a test and can tell you what it is. That doesn't mean, sure. You know, you, you say that you need to be at work on time and work while you're there. A kid can write all that down. doesn't mean that they're going to do those yeah. same things. Yep. As I listen to 
I, the same things caught my attention at Kansas Can. I mean, I, I will also say that I felt like it was more of a telling tour than a listening tour. <laughs> I mean, there wasn't a lot of, there was two yeah. opportunities for feedback, but um, on an app. But I, all I kept thinking was exactly what Dr. Burke was saying, where, well, first I thought two things. I felt a little defensive for our teachers in that. I thought we have sports that are holding people accountable and teaching them work, work ethic. I mean, football, look at football or soccer or whatever the sport is. If they're late to a class, they're reprimanded for that. Like, I, I just feel like our teachers are doing all they can in that. And all I kept thinking to Dr. Burke's point is why isn't anybody saying the word parent? in any of this no one is saying parents so i think well, the parents if the parents had the data from the telling tour that this is what the businesses are saying maybe that would be eye-opening to the parents so miss Celia, i heard you reference football so were you talking about our broncos win over paola last? Definitely. okay Definitely. i just wanted to clarify and that and, and ottawa coming up yes um, call right now. <laughs> so, you, so, uh, so I, I, I just I'll gather some more thoughts around it. Where you know, maybe find that that fine line between <laughs> parenting and education. Um, but I just know from experience, my own kids, um, I've tried to teach them time management skills, and they they don't listen to me because I'm not a teacher. So, it's it's that again. If, if they're not going to listen to me, but to listen to a teacher and get the skills, I'd rather have that than nothing at all. So, and Jason, I, that's one reason that. why we put it in the strategic plan as partner with families. Because right. the fact right. is, we're already busting our tails to teach all the academic stuff and whatever. And, and it's important. This is the stuff that makes you successful. I don't disagree with uh, Dr. Watson at all at the importance of them. But we're going to try our best to do our part, and we're going to try to engage our families to do their part as well. Yeah, and I think that we'll see how it comes out of the State Board of Education, if there's any changes, because I have a feeling there can be some changes to some um, standards, not curriculum, but standards or what we will be teach in public schools. So was, anyway, it was also six year old data. Yeah. There's that. List. <laughs> it's still relevant. It is, but it's not. Current. I don't think it's really changed. So right. just to put a bow around this one, I, I think it's it's important that we look at that data. I think if you look at that information, what struck us was uh, talking about professionalism. But if you look at that list, there are components that that businesses are telling Kansas Department of Education that are absolutely well, educational. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, verbal communication, critical thinking, problem solving, information technology applications, written communication. So those are all things that we do uh, as an organization. And so I don't think it's, we teach all of them. I think what Brad just brought up is critical is we have the whole list and we identify where we collaborate mm. and where we have. Uh, yeah, maybe that's. That actually so. might be a good topic for one of our Friday retreats. Free you know, Monday, fifth, fifth Monday, fifth Monday, fifth Monday, not Friday. Don't yeah. make me come. <laughs> so, fifth okay. Monday. We'll add that to the list and and yeah, let's, other... let's um yeah, and then we can talk about it. Not Miss Mitchell, you want to come stuff. Friday at seven o'clock? Oh, okay. We kind of started solving the problem, and yeah, so, so we just want to have so, it for a discussion. So I just we we'll do it next semester. Just put it on. You can put it on the list, but we we'll okay. talk about it next semester. Anything else we'll to add? Where about. where on the list would I'll you like? You know. the, okay, thank you. Dr. Burke, what's the uh, status of the J.C. Dalton update? Uh, we can probably give you one at the next full meeting, which in October. Okay. Uh, for the breakfast and lunch update, what are you wanting? I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Give you some stuff ahead of time. Okay. Any other items to add for future discussion? Board work calendar, Dr. Burke? Yeah, we uh, at the last work session, we went over quite a bit of our strategic plan and some of our action plans, uh, routine business. Can Kansas Teacher of the Year Banquet, uh, not believing they're doing it in person. I think they rolled everything over again. And then uh, approved crisis plans, and we'll be doing that tonight during the executive session. All right, committee reports. Um, I attended uh, Kansas KSP Board of Directors meeting. Um, it was 
pretty pretty standard meeting. Um, we'll have uh, we got a advocacy update. Um, start talking about the legislative committee. What there may be some changes from that on what we're going to advocate for the legislator legislative agenda for next year. Um, talked about the um, annual convention that's coming up in November, not December. It's in November. Um, and it's in Overland Park. So cool. you guys can attend that without that having switched. a hotel. And it's Overland Park. I thought yeah. I switched out. That's good news. We're, they're, they switch it off every year. Okay. Um, so um, sign up for that. <laughs> um, they'll have, it, it's changed a little bit. They're not doing things the way we usually do them. They're going to yeah, it, whenever the schedule come out, it'll it'll be quite a bit different. Um, they're doing delegate assembly, not on Sunday, but on Friday um, and some other things. So um, be looking out for that. The um, the other thing that was the, the big topic was um, it's called Kansas Board Solutions. And that's a it's they created a um, wholly owned subsidiary that is a for-profit company of a non-profit company. And the reason they did that is they were getting too much profit on their services that they offer. Yeah, okay. Um, sure, yeah, I sure. I like um, so they spun that off so they could do um, more of that cert, you know, leadership services and all of their, especially their work comp insurance and that sort of thing that they make money on. Um, so we have that and KSB is the sole shareholder and they get a dividend back from, um, so they get, they'll get money back from that um, company. And I, I'm on the board of directors for that. Um, the library, Johnson County Library Board is going well, learning a lot. Um, just passed our budget for that. It's so <laughs> Dr. Berg smiles when I say that. <laughs> I'm just passed our budget for that and um, have a retreat coming up in the evening in a couple of weeks. Um, there is a lot of talk. I mean, Spring Hill is like second on the list now to look at the library oh, in good. Spring Hill. I think that that is awesome. It's definitely, they probably think that's all I talk about, <laughs> but that's us, right? So that's my job. Um, they would like also to look at our retreat. I'll be curious to hear all about this, but more about partnering more with our school librarians um, that's interesting too. So we'll see. We'll see what we think about that too. Um, other than that, oh, Timber Sage is site council tomorrow and Spring Hill High School is next Tuesday morning. So I'll report back on those next time. The reason I looked at Sharon is how many years ago Sharon and I met with the Johnson County and Sean and we proposed. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, so you were there too, weren't you? <laughs> And we proposed having a combination, the Johnson County Library at the Spring Hill High School. Mm. And they were very adamantly, thanks, yes. but no thanks, and go away and don't ever come back. Really? So. so another thing that's interesting, just for the community, and Sharon, I would love to talk to you about this, is just the places, even throughout Spring Hill, that they had books this summer. Some of them ended up being a little bit controversial. And so some of our local businesses declined to do this next summer. So... It's fascinating what's, I, I had no idea all that was involved in the library, <laughs> but it is fascinating. Now, you do. <laughs> now I am learning. Yeah. But Spring Hill is second. Spring Hill right now is second. Yes. Further than I guess. So. Good job. I'm loud. Okay. <laughs> Any other committees? <clears throat> oh, I forgot to mention, I'll be in Jackson Hole, Wyoming for Western Region Conference for NSBA. Mm -hmm. Very good. Not a bad place. No. Nice snowball fight. Do we have any information on the possible national convention? That would be January, right? It's it's in April and it's in San Diego. In April in San Diego. As of right now, it is still on. Okay. Yeah, in person. In San Diego. Okay. I don't want to. And uh, I whenever will we have tentative dates, can we? Can it, no, it's a firm date. It is. Yeah. I don't have it in my calendar. I'll but. I'll send you the link. Okay. Um, also our. Uh, one of our Kansas representatives um, from Seaman High School or Seaman Board um, 
God, why can't I think of his name? He's the secretary treasurer and president elect of, of NSBA. So in 2023 at the convention, he will be the president and associate, um, Frank Henderson. Yes. He'll be um, presenting, he'll run the whole thing. So it'd be re really good to have that representation from Kansas at a national level. Allie, just to address your question, the NSBA conference is April 2nd through the 4th. Thank you. I live by my calendar. So, As soon as rooms are made available, we will start these rooms. Okay. Doesn't look like we can start till October. Katie? <laughs> uh, I just went to their website, nsba.org. Yeah, that's different. Oh, the K, because the data that I pulled up was different. I'm like, what's going on? Because I trust you. <laughs> we got a uh, superintendent okay. report. Got it. Yeah. Hey, next week is Mass uh, in America <laughs> Association of uh, School Superintendents. And so uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a regional meeting. Uh, kind of excited that I get to go to that. Uh, Kansas is... Each, there are eight regions and each region gets eight superintendents. So Kansas has had a long uh, history of, of really good attendance. So I'll be heading out Tuesday next week, be back on Friday. Brad will be in the district. So I'll have my cell phone, but letting you know where I'll be at next week. That's it. Good, we do need an executive session. 15 minutes tops. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the board go into executive session to discuss the district crisis plans pursuant to the exception under COMA for school security matters to ensure the security of the school, its buildings, and or its <laughs> systems is not jeopardized. Those to be in session include the Board of Education members, Superintendent of Schools, Assistant Superintendent of Schools. Anybody else? Anybody else? Just you and me. Uh, the executive session to begin at 935 and to resume in this place no later than 10 o'clock. Second. Let's move second and move executive session uh, to discuss matters relating to security under coma. Can you please collect your vote? Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Winbolt? Yes. Mr. Updike? Yes. Mrs. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Sealing? Yes. Approved.